All right, well, let's start this off properly. Welcome to what I'm calling Web3 Galaxy Brain, uh, which is kind cool. of a vehicle for me to hang out with cool people on a Friday afternoon, try and uh, relax a little bit. I guess it's not an afternoon for you. Uh, welcome, Ellie Day. Hello. Yeah, I'm in London right now. Been here for a little bit, but I'll be going back to the US on Sunday probably. But yeah, I've been hanging out with my co-founder, Maz, who is sitting sort of close to me in the same room, also listening to this space. So hopefully there's not some weird tear in space time you know, from that. But uh, yeah, glad to be here. We've been DMing and had some calls, but you know, now I get to talk with some audience slash like, I don't know, about stuff. So yeah, excited to be here. Totally, so yeah. Thanks for coming first, out. So you said like, Maz is your uh, co-founder? I don't know Maz. Yeah, she's... Uh, if you see the person with the green avatar profile picture in the audience, that's her. Oh, welcome. Yeah, we actually, it was actually kind of cool how we met. We got introduced through Julia Lipton, who's like a cool person I know. And I've heard of Julia yeah, Lipton. Like, what does Julia Lipton get up to? I forget. I don't know how to like share things in this. Oh, if you go to the scene. tweet and you hit the like share button, there's like a share to spaces uh, thing at the top. Nice. Okay. Well, maybe I'll try to do that. But yeah. She runs this like awesome people ventures thing, but is also like an awesome person herself. And we went, Maz and I were at a dinner that Julia was hosting in, in Lisbon back like in October. And yeah, we just like we're both kind of like looking for co founders. I like was determined to do what I am working on now, like either way with or without a co founder. But we just like kind of realized we were a good fit. And then I flew out to London to basically work with her and see if it was a good fit. And it has been so yeah that's how that works sometimes you just like meet people and realize it's a good fit we're both like you know have similar experiences and backgrounds like but it's like complimentary so i'm still trying to figure out how to share a, a tweet no um, problem no problem um so what yeah. what are those complimentary skill sets actually i'm curious yeah good question so i'm like historically uh you know more technical and product focused and um i would say Maz, on the other hand, is, I mean, she likes to call herself a generalist. These days, like, oftentimes people become generalists by focusing on lots of different, I mean, that is, like, kind of definition. You focus on lots of different things, but almost, like, by focusing on lots of things deeply, you almost become, like, generally really good at lots of different stuff. So I guess to complement my, like, more product and, and engineering background, she has a lot of experience, like, in growth and marketing, just overall, like, operations of early stage companies or, you know, most recently she was a VC. So yeah, just like all around someone who, I mean, a good way to say it is she likes making calendar invites. I procrastinate making cal calendar <laughs> invites. So you always need someone on your team who likes wrangling a calendar. So Definitely need to cover those bases. It's, uh, and uh, so we'll get into what AOL is going to be, uh, which is a hilarious name, by the way. Um, but there's Thanks, also, there is yeah. also a DAO attached, correct? Or there will be a DAO. Yeah. Yeah. There, well, interestingly, the name always online or AOL for short actually came from the DAO side of things. Like this, it sort of originated back in, in like April It's sort of an offshoot from FWB friends with benefits. Like, and it was originally like the discord was made Phil from FWB. I don't actually know. His, I mean, I think that's his actual name, but I don't know like his last name or anything. But Phil, all I know is he roller skates in real life. But anyways, like him and I like made a Discord, and we originally called it Gorilla Apes. We because it was like the idea of like we were just gonna like make a Discord for people to ape into like shit coins and degenerate like DeFi <laughs> stuff like Degen DeFi. So it was like pretty cool, but we needed like a better name. So we asked GPT three because I had a GPT three account. Awesome. We asked uh, GPT-3 what we should name, I guess, name the, the DAO or the Discord. And we decided to, but and decide, GPT-3 decided that um, Apes Online was actually a good um, name because, I mean, we were like, wow, that's awesome. You know, AOL, throwback, uh, it was great. So I was like, you know, the AI that OpenAI built, uh, you know, actually was doing the important work of helping this, like, Discord group come up with a cool name. So kind of just like we had planned to launch like some sort of throwback type interface that was originally going to be on AOL.gg is going to be sort of a front page of web three type thing. And 
you know, at that point, um, I was like also like trying to figure out what I was going to spend my time, you know, doing like essentially my next like venture in the, in the space. And so at, at the time, like dabbled in other stuff, AOL, the DAO, AOL, the DAO kind of, it wasn't even fully a DAO. It was like an emerging, it was like a pre DAO, like a precursor to a DAO was just like almost in hibernation. But like, I knew that like, if it was like via me working on it directly or just like helping the DAO get funding that the time would be right. And uh, yeah, so like many months passed, but like we had this boardroom, which was like a private channel with sort of like the main supporters. And it wasn't until recently that it sort of like, I came back to my roots of apes online and we had since like realized that we needed to like have a more general name. So that's when we came up with always online Someone in the server came up with it. And uh, from there, it was like the project that I was working on, which is now always online, like the AOL underscore XYZ Twitter, was most recently called Counter. That was just a name that like someone came up with. Didn't really have too much of a backstory. But I realized that like we could sort of like join forces, the DAO side of things, and then like the AOL Inc. And I think what's really cool is like, unlike Web3 projects that start with like a centralized team and like a corporation and then progressively decentralized like you could have a corporation that sort of exists at the same time as a a decentralized DAO but like the corporation is almost like a partner of the DAO and the DAO is a partner of the corporation so it's more of like a symbiotic relationship I think like you know at least like in 2021 corporations still have like the corporate structure still has a lot of power I guess like there's as much as I would love for like DAO only forms of like organizing i still think like there's a lot of things you get from like traditional corporate structures in the u.s and elsewhere we definitely have a plan of like you know we even have two separate twitters like aol underscore xyz is the corporation and then the other i guess the twitter is always online dow i believe yeah um and that's like still has the original like ape based branding we never we haven't changed it yet And the websites are not online yet. You know, it's intentionally kind of like lacking a presence. But yeah, like the plan, this is kind of semi-secret. Actually, I can't say it (laughs) because don't don't say a secret. Yeah. Oh well, it's more like you know SEC rules. Oh, I see. I see. see. It's more I can't. I think like that'd break the rules. Yeah, but if slide into my DMs if you want to talk about things. But pretty sure the SEC will get mad. I'm not supposed to say like oh. Never mind. I'm just gonna. But yeah, big things coming. Um, if you at all like are uh, want to talk, like I can. Okay, so so you, you know, can't you can't announce anything yeah. about whatever might you know uh, pique the interest of everybody's favorite uh, three letter organization. But uh, in general, what has this aping DGen project become? What what was what was the name of the uh, counter you said was the other project? That- yeah, yeah. So counter was like what I was like individually pursuing as like my I guess like like to say like my serious project in web three because the rest of it was just fun. But then I was like, why, you know, just have, why have like two separate things like, a, you know, so I just kind of, we merged it together and, and the DAO is like sort of going to be retaining its roots as like, you know, more of like a DGen based, just like sort of just a more like shadowy super coder type vibe. But the actual like AOL, you know, underscore XYZ Twitter handle, like the, the vibe of always online Inc is going to be just like sort of, think back to like 1999 to 2004 the the era of the internet before facebook destroyed democracy before all of the unique individuality of deviant art and uh i don't know just like i mean geocities was kind of like on its way out but you know just like back when not everyone was on the internet so it was kind of like a fun place to hang out and uh it was even before our beloved cryptocurrencies got there but um imagine that that ethos of, you know, the internet before it turned into a big corporate homogenous bland yeah. thing of web two social media. And uh, let's like combine that with the cool parts of cryptocurrency and sort of like make uh, a gateway to web three. And then like, let's use that sort of, I don't know, I like to call it like a, a venue, like a, like a metaphysical space for, you know, communities like web three native communities to exist and everything let's like use that metaphysical space that would live on like these channels within AOL.xyz. That's the domain we have. Like, let's like make this space a space for organizing a space for 
sharing kind of like all the good stuff about the space that we're building. Let's use it to like organize and like really like develop like strong intellectual property and technology that can then power literally like the internet infrastructure that we need to like coordinate I don't know, this future that we're trying to build. So it's definitely like fitting of the Web3 Galaxy Brain t- title of today. Awesome. Like I'm not even joking. Like I really want this internet that we have to be user owned. I want the laborers who build in this space, like all of us to actually get the value that we create and have it like accurately accrued to us. I think like, you know, DAOs aren't, DAOs are a layer to coordinate, but they're not the final stage of like how we operate and collaborate as humans. Um, Some of you may have been seeing like my tweets about decentralized joint ventures, but that's something I'm pretty excited about because like, I think like throughout history, like people have had to come out with like, have, have had to make these essentially containers that, that are like boundaries of where value accrues when it's not able to be like precisely allocated to an individual. So you can think about like a corporation, the, the value, like you get paid as a worker, a salary or like money in some shape or form. That's essentially like a very inaccurate and generally like not fair way of getting paid. So all of the like, intellectual property and value that you create by default anything that's not like pre-negotiated accrues to the corporation like the outer container of like this coordination and work that's going on so with you know tokens and sort of you know even nfts and just like these like crypto native ways of coordinating that's obviously like an improvement because now there's tokens and like you can be a user of of Uniswap or ENS or Gitcoin, all these things, and sort of get a, get a retroactive airdrop of the value that you were producing, you know, potentially years ago. You know, like all of the people who got ENS airdrops, like essentially like the protocol was paying you back for the value that you added some point in the past. Like they probably should have paid you interest as well. With like decentralized joint ventures, the idea is to actually, um, it's like ideally becomes a primitive that's not owned by anyone. Essentially, it becomes like an ERC-721 type standard that can be used in ever like, it's just like people can implement it. But the idea is like, let's just say all of us who are on this call, like wanted to move forward some reusable feature or implementation or like something that like is, is sort of like intellectual property in the traditional like corporate sense. Web3 Web Galaxy Brain. Like, let's say we take Web3 Galaxy Brain and we turn it into some shared, uh, you know, this space doesn't require yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like. Um, even independent of a DAO, we're all part of DAOs. We all like are also humans, probably. There may see maybe some AIs among us, but we're all like people that like are just trying to like you know make stuff happen in this space. So instead of like the work that we do being like a, essentially the value that we create being and essentially the value creates wealth, you know, like labor results in value, and then like that value becomes like wealth when it's like combined in the right way so instead of like that value like assignment being like attributed to like the DAOs that we're a part of it actually gets attributed to you know this decentralized joint venture one might be like oh why is that how is that different than a DAO it's like well like decentralized joint ventures are almost like headless DAOs they don't have to have the same amount of branding as a DAO they don't have to like you know sort of an institution they're really just like you could imagine that in a like a more software engineering sense, like it might be like project or even like a sprint might be structured as a decentralized joint venture. And what's interesting is like would that be like, a, like would a split be an example of a decentralized joint venture in your mind, or is that yeah? Uh, I mean, that's like sort of like getting there. I think it's like the idea is like, and I think DAOs all around like are trying to figure this out. It's like how do you like break a a group of, like how do you like break a bigger DAO up into smaller pieces so they can actually like ah, uh, perfect yes I want I want to get into uh, I want to talk about para DAOs I think that's your term uh, sub DAOs yeah uh, I've been uh, sort of ranting about occasionally um, mm-hmm. so yeah, there, yeah. There, Cooper uh, put out a a post recently this week I think on Mirror about sub DAOs I I have a bit of a bone to pick with sub DAOs because my feeling is. I don't want to be in a sub DAO. I want to be in a proper DAO if I'm in a DAO. And mm-hmm. there's no, it seems like, it sort of seems inevitable that people are reaching for this term sub DAO. So I think we're not going to be able to escape the use of the word sub DAO. But to me, yeah. it's it's like, uh, 
I understand that, say, fingerprints incubating raw DAO, or there's another one that they also incubated, and taking like a percentage of the tokens, sort of uh, pre-mined tokens, pre-minted tokens mm -hmm. for their work incubating it. <clears throat> I understand that activity, but I sort I don't really feel that that. I know I, from what I understand for fingerprints, the idea is to expand membership. They need means to expand membership, but I don't really mm -hmm. see that as a sub DAO to me. It, Raw DAO is just another DAO, and it just so happens that I don't know, fifteen percent of its tokens belong to fingerprints. But I would hope that that would mean that it's you know, aside from the fact that fifteen percent are owned by another DAO, it's now fully independent and is not sub in any way, is not subordinate or subsidiary. Instead, mm -hmm. it's just a certain percentage of its tokens have been allotted to the DAO that incubated it. But um, you know, it doesn't owe them anything beyond that and whatever governance they can squeeze out of what tokens they have, I would imagine. So I'm curious yeah. what you think about paradows and, and things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was like sort of my complaints or like sort of gut feelings about the use of sub DAOs. Like, you know, just like even with through like this summer with the evolution of, you know, working groups or, you know, I guess like they've been called sub DAOs within like FWB friends with benefits. Like it always felt like a bit weird because it sort of it does like imply like a sense of hierarchy and that like these this like you know call it a sub DAO is essentially a, a agent of a bigger DAO whereas like functionally it I don't see why it needs to be essentially nested under a bigger DAO totally. and that's what I started to think about like you know the terminology you mentioned para DAO um, para being like parallel DAO um, instead of like subordinate DAO and you know I don't think para DAO like is like maybe going to be the the thing that sticks either but it's just important to like think about that like whenever you have this like if DAOs are like the term i mean that's the term that everyone uses like i really think like you know the words that we call like groups of people coordinating towards like a a common objective like you know you can call it whatever you want but i think like depending on like the way you understand things like it's going to have like a bit of a different practical for I sure, guess. for sure. Reality, you know, because like, for example, if you're a, a sub DAO of FWB, even though you are like a group of people that probably like have a membership of FWB, like you also are working on this thing and like you're uh, creating value. And like, does that mean that like the value accrues to the sub DAO or does it flow through back up to the parent DAO? And that's why I think like DJVs like are perhaps like um, even a better version of like paradows in the sense that like DAOs, you know groups of people might emerge from other DAOs, but like i think djvs are implicitly like or actually more explicitly rather neutral to like the associations like so like for example you mentioned like that raw DAO or whatever like fingerprints DAO is like a 15 percent stake in uh that sub DAO. like with a djv the idea is like you could have a a sort of a funder like so, so, for example, let's just say like with um, Web3 Galaxy Brain is like sort of a, going back to the example of Web3 Galaxy Brain is a DJV. Instead of it being like a, a DAO, and instead of it being a sub DAO, instead of it being like whatever we used before, like you can have like a funder. So like, let's just say, Nick, you're like really passionate about this. So you as like sort of someone who's an early person, you can contribute, maybe put in some ETH to sort of like kickstart the treasury of this DJV. But then let's just say I sort of take off and run with this. I can start using the treasury because, you know, you could grant me tokens and, you know, of the DJV. And then I could, um, I could start, you know, accruing value via some like potentially coordinate type mechanism. But what's cool is like, you know, this isn't part of like an existing DAO. Like you could actually have like one of our affiliated DAOs like choose to vote and fund this decentralized joint venture you know it's more of like a unit of work that also has like DAO like capabilities built into it but what's cool is like it can be like as granular as we want in the case of uh this like there is like potentially a brand associated with it but unlike DAOs that generally have to have like a twitter account they you know they have to have like a discord all of these things djvs are essentially like more headless they're intentionally like more of an impersonal thing because they actually allow us more to like i guess go outside of the boundaries of our like guilds or squads or 
whatever like organizational boundaries that we find ourselves in. So okay, so um, wait, so I, I'm a little confused. So for anybody who joined us yeah. recently, decentralized joint venture, decentralized joint venture is what DJV stands for. So the purpose of a DJV, actually, just to finish up what we were saying about sub DAOs and, and such before, I also know that like um, there are really large DAOs like Bankless DAO that has a concept of guilds, um, mm-hmm. and they also are sort of working through you know the Dupont versus Apple. Um, divisional versus um, sort of product oriented uh, team structures. I think they're trying mm-hmm. to figure, figure that out as well. I think guild is an interesting word. I think, I believe they have guilds for each skill set. So if you're like a developer or a marketer or whatever, you might go into a different guild. Uh, I'm not a super expert on Bankless, although they are doing incredible research. Uh, and I heard them speak, uh, uh, someone from there speak in Shark uh, a month or two ago. It was really informative. Yeah, I mean, I could give you a better example if you want that's based on like what were one of the first use cases of a DJV would be. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, if it, also if anyone wants to like be added to the Telegram group, the working group, which eventually is going to become a DJV in its own, right, which is kind of cool. A practical exa- example is there's a syndicate DAO or syndicate, like they have people working on on-chain token gating. So there's a developer on their team, Connor, very, you know, genius, you know, programmer, uh, very awesome, very nice person in general, basically came up with this innovative primitive that can be used to like uh, enable on-chain token gating. Then you have Guild, Guild XYZ, which many of you know, they're doing off-chain token gating, and they're also thinking about uh, token gating. They're like these. So there's these two companies that are thinking about token gating. They have people working on token gating. So if you think about like what a joint venture is, it literally is like a joint venture. It is a. It can be structured legally different in the in in the real world, the old world, so to speak. You know, the Web two world. But the general idea is like it's two independent entities coming together to create something. So the decentralized joint venture takes that one step further and allows not just two entities, but potentially n number of entities, uh, whether that be a person or other DAOs or guilds within other DAOs to come together to work and uh, I guess like cultivate, you know, intellectual property and then benefit from that cultivation. So practically speaking, you would have Connor, who works at Syndicate, you would have, uh, let's just say, Raz, who works, Robert, who works at Guild, you might have Syndicate, the DAO, you might have Guild, the DAO, so that's like four agents right now in this DJV, so you have the DAOs that, like, sort of, like, non-person entities, non-human person entities, funding, like, contributing capital to this DJV, but then you have the two humans that are actually doing the labor accruing uh, ownership of essentially the tokens that represent the, the DJV based on uh, consensus of the stakeholders. So um, it's really critical that like we separate the actual people doing the labor from the entities that fund the, the, I guess the, the labor. So I think the reason it's important is because you can imagine that in this case, like, Let's just say, you know, there's people who work at Guild, there's people that work at Syndicate, and then there's just like people who are individuals who don't belong to a specific DAO. In this case, you can actually, it's like you could have me, like I could be a part of this DJV to develop on-chain token gating. I can like, you know, talk a lot about the strategy and stuff. And then um, in the same way that you would have like sprints in like an agile programming sense, you can have retrospectives at the end of these sprints that, where everyone sort of mutually agrees on like value that was, you know, contributions that were contributed over a time period. And that would allow the individuals to, I guess, like accrue ownership of this DJV. But what's really interesting is like beyond the actual work getting done, like we all can do work, you know, in a DAO, but like what happens like in terms of like the ownership of the, I guess, the innovation that was done. Let's just say like if you didn't have a DJV developing this token gating feature, what would happen normally is uh, let's just say like, you know, Syndicate is developing this. Uh, whoever developed like a feature for them is going to get compensated based on the, like the equity compensation agreement that they signed before this feature was actually even like conceived by the people who worked on it. So they're already like capped in, sen- in terms of the upside that they're able to, you know, receive. 
but in terms of the benefit, the value, and then the wealth that was like created via the intellectual property that they uh, generated, that value is actually going to automatically by default accrue to the the, the out, outmost container, which is like syndicate as an entity, whether it be a DAO or a corporation. But if the people who participated in the creation of like on-chain token gating were were in doing this via DJV, they would actually accrue ownership in the DJV, which is a more it's which is a container that's actually closer to the labor that's actually being done and the intellectual property that's being cultivated. So it actually catches that that value and assigns ownership closer to the labor. And what's cool is now like you can actually have compensation that more mirrors um, you know sales of NFTs, for example, by artists or um, you know creators in that realm. Like I think like knowledge workers are actually like you know we obviously have a lot of advantages um, in terms of the work we get to type to, we get to do, but like more often like because it's like technically burdensome by default to like granularly like allocate ownership of like a big DAO, for example, people just aren't able to do it. But with if, if like projects and like even features or, or primitives are um, structured as DJVs, you actually can make it so the people who innovate and do the work, you know, whether it's a squad or a guild, they actually are the ones who are co-owners of that, that intellectual property, which then can result in future royalty payments in the same way an owner, an artist of an NFT, even if that like, that NFT is sold in the future, they can continue to benefit financially from the value that they've created or like the, what they've created. So that's the general idea is to like bring the like ownership closer to the people that create things that end up being owned. So, so um, if I understand, um, basically what you're saying is a DJV is a structure that allows for individuals or DAOs or companies, any entity, I mean, in, in our world, maybe you just say an address, any address can mm-hmm. participate in uh, something that looks a little bit like a split, but you mentioned retrospectives. So it sounds a little bit, it also reminds me a little bit of, of um, Coordinate. So I, like I'm hearing yeah, like well, splits, uh, court, for those who don't know in the audience, Coordinate is sort of a reputation system uh, for, I don't know what it's for in general, but it's used in DAOs a lot in order to assign basically people who participate in an epoch, which is the name of the time frame cycles. Uh, Mm -hmm. In one epoch, uh, members of a DAO who have uh, been included in the, I forget there's a term for it, like the circle or something like this. In any case, participants in the epoch are allotted a certain number of tokens and they're able to uh, you know, allocate those tokens to other people in the epoch. And it's a way to mm-hmm. sort of determine who contributed the most based on what other contributors think. It's not perfect. And it's, I'd say, experimental. There's obviously opportunities for people to create uh, sort of little groups that all uh, pat each other's back, etc. There's also problems around who gets the most, you know, people who talk the most in the Discord or Telegram obviously have a better chance of getting tokens allotted to them than people who are maybe quietly doing work on GitHub that isn't as visible. Um, but that, that, so I'm hearing a little bit of like coordinate in the sense that we're going to come together to work on a project. Some people are going to be contributing funds. Some people are going to not even be people, but be entities composed of many people, be they corporate or, um, you know, decentrally native, uh, DAO type organizations. And there's going to be individuals. Mm-hmm. And most likely it's the individuals who are going to be doing the, uh, sort of, uh, groundwork to make the thing happen. Although who knows, uh, but in mm-hmm. any case that there could then be some kind of, let's say they're going to create some kind of. I mean, there, there was a piece you mentioned that it's sort of not about as much um, like a headlessness, like uh, in a way a DAO tends to so far require a kind of brand that people are familiar mm-hmm. with, but a DJV maybe is not as necessarily attached to a well-known brand. Yeah, like ideally a DJV is more of, I, eventually it will like, I anticipate it will sort of become more of a protocol versus like something that people are like even actively actively aware of doing. But I think, like, it just kind of goes back to my point I tried to emphasize that, like, as it stands now, like, a lot of the issues we're having with scaling, like, DAOs is that there is, like, a sense of tension among the people actually doing the work and the, I guess, the structures that, like, I guess, inflate the the underlying token that represents the, the, all of the labor and work and energy that is, like, a result of the DAO and its members uh, coordinating. So it's a bit of like a, definitely more of like a a left-leaning take on it. But like, you know, it's just this idea that just because you 
were early and like accumulated ownership uh, in a traditional like container of, you know, like, like, cause like as it stands now, like DAOs are lines in the sand that say, okay, everything in this circle, the token will accrue that value. Right. And, right. Like, right. Because I see so what like, I see is the, like the possibility of what you're suggesting. I think DAOs are hitting this point where it's like, if you were early in a DAO, you potentially have more tokens than someone coming in later, but you may then become distracted, find some other project. You already have a bunch of tokens. So why bother working on the new initiative that's really going to carry the DAO into the future? And for new entrants, it's less incentivizing for them that they have less access to the tokens themselves, aside from whatever community funds the treasury of the DAO is able to allocate to them. So it sounds like maybe a DJV is a partial solution to how do we uh, a portion off a new project and then allow people who participate in that new project to be compensated fairly for their work rather than all of the value being accrued by the larger organization that they're a part of, which maybe they don't have a huge stake in. Yeah, I think like the main pieces are, are that, um, but also to like essentially remove like organizational boundaries. Like one of the beauties of Web3 is like you don't have to like work for one company. You can sort of weave in and out of collaborating between a bunch of different initiatives like whether that be a DAO based project or just like people you know raising money to buy the constitution or whatever you know like i heard about that one technically yeah (laughs) technically um you know constitution DAO didn't need to be like a DAO and like you know sort of was more of an ephemeral DAO. i would i would argue that like buying the constitution or like raising money to do something specific you know could be suitable more as like a djv than a DAO. like technically there was lots of stakeholders some people contributed capital. Some people contributed labor. You know, labor is capital. You know, so it's just like, um, I think there just needs to be more specificity and granularity in how we as, I guess, like humans that exist in the space, like, are allocated, the, I guess, the fruits of our labor, you know? So, um, so but brass yeah. tax, like, um, and I guess this is an experimental idea also that you're working on in this Telegram group that unfortunately we can't share to the Twitter because it seems this space is, refuses to have pinned tweets. But in any case, you can go search Ellie's tweets and find uh, the, the Telegram group. Uh, what, what is the difference uh, on a technical level between what you're thinking about and just, I mean, frankly, a sub DAO or some new kind of DAO um, like a project specific DAO, let's say Shark DAO wants to do a new project and needs to get a Solidity developer, but a Solidity developer doesn't want to work for ETH. They want to work for a share of some new project. Mm-hmm. So why would Shark DAO not just spin up a new DAO or is a DJV a kind of, potentially a kind of DAO? Yeah, I think like, that's a good question. DAO is like a term that people that have spent a lot of time, like getting people aware of the what it means but also that obviously adds like confusion because everyone has different opinions on what it means so um i think it's more about less about like a technical you know difference like in theory you could use the same software that's used for for DAOs in djvs but i think it's more of like a semantic slash like i guess like conceptual difference that like okay you know it's sort of like intent versus you know just like i guess it's, it's sort of just the agreement that like i just so fwb for example like or even just all of these DAOs that have sort of grown beyond their initial core team have often, you know, formed guilds. And I think guilds are really good, a good abstraction for grouping people into logical guilds are basically a fancy word for teams. And um, I think the key part of do you form another DAO or do you form like a DJV? I think DJVs are more of like, if you think about whatever like project management tool you have, a DJV might be like, the project that you make that then contains like tickets and or think about like a Kanban board that represents a project. Like a DJV is probably that project and a project has, you know, has stakeholders. It has, uh, you know, people who will do the work. I just argue that like the, I guess like the ultimate owners of the, I guess, intellectual property that's like was created by this project shouldn't default to be like a DAO or like a corporation. So it should be, yeah. Yeah. So because I think what you're also touching on another point that I think about a lot, which is like, um, you know, DAO is like this really broad term. Um, I think a lot, a lot of the time, obviously there was the DAO, uh, but also, Mm -hmm. you know, DAO, like maybe DAO 1.0, uh, before the current era was more, uh, maybe more in line of like what ENS is doing, Uniswap, uh, like essentially a governance token for managing a DeFi protocol, uh, where the DeFi mm-hmm. protocol 
in most cases predates the governance token, although it can also be the other direction. Whereas now, what, what I don't want to use this like uh, uh, integer-based system. Like I, I don't want to call it DAO too, but whatever's going mm -hmm. on on Juicebox, on Mirror, you know, there's a lot of different people who are, uh, there, and there's many other protocols also that are super interesting. Th these are, uh, you know, a DAO house comes to mind, Moloch. These are you know, NFT collector DAOs, software development DAOs that are run more like small businesses or startups. Um, mm -hmm. Not to pique any anybody's interest uh, from the from law <laughs> enforcement, but uh, you know, investor DAOs are, are things that people talk about a lot. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm also interested in like DAOs where, like, I, th I think a split um, is even a form of a DAO. It doesn't have mm -hmm. it, it doesn't have governance in the same way, uh, and maybe that to some people that's like the uh, bright line around what makes a DAO a DAO, the fact that there should be some kind of governance. But I was actually very interested uh, earlier in the year, maybe three months ago or so, uh, this artist Brad Trammell, uh, uh, who's a really awesome artist on memes uh, from years ago, mm -hmm. um, published this piece on NFTs, a uh, video piece. He does these great reports uh, on his uh, Patreon channel. And unfortunately, he doesn't really understand crypto. And, and the second half of the video is kind of a in my opinion, vaguely embarrassing take on uh, NFTs. But the first half of the video, he makes some really incredible points. And the one that uh, I found most like shocking was his, he, he really hates this artist Cause, uh, who's like a kind of like a meme art, meme fine artist whose work sell for tons of money, sort of in the, not, mm -hmm. not, not quite Banksy, but in, in that neighborhood, um, but more just like iconographic uh, repetition of the same character. Um, and he really, really dislikes mm -hmm. this artist. He thinks it's like totally bankrupt as, as art and, and indicates how bankrupt the fine art market had become uh, at that time. I have no take on this. I couldn't care less, frankly. But he does point out that like what the what happened in the fine art world was that the, at least from his perspective, it, with quite a lot of knowledge about fine art, is that the museums were like tastemakers in art for the longest time. And they told the wealthy what, you know, their, their profession was telling the wealthy what art was worth collecting. And so they serve mm -hmm. this role as tastemakers. But over time, through, I don't know, consumerization, rise of a even more uh, new middle class in America and elsewhere, um, the tastes of consumers have kind of invaded the fine art world. So things like, you know, Virgil Abloh, actually, everyone's thinking about Virgil lately, uh, of course, RIP. Virgil's work and other streetwear work like that had made it into the fine art spaces, but that was work that came from a very commercial uh, remix culture. And so uh, over time, the sort of authority of the galleries and the um, fine art museums has been eroded such that the wealthy people uh, are of a kind of middle class pop culture and tell they tell we tell the museums what's cool and the museums respond by having shows on Nike and on Louis Vuitton, et cetera. And Mm -hmm. All of this is a uh, background to sort of set up the point that I thought was really interesting in, in his video in the first half, at least, which was he talks a about fandoms and how fandoms are fundamentally decentralized. And it makes me think about BTS, et cetera, all these fan cultures you mm -hmm. can find online. And it made me at the time reflect on DAOs because uh, really a fandom is like a, a really decentralized non-organization, but a, a genuinely decentralized following to a particular cultural movement, uh, like mm -hmm. what you might find on Reddit, et cetera. Whereas a DAO or what we traditionally think of as a DAO, which is like a, a governance token uh, driven treasury or management of some kind of protocols parameters is actually in some ways you could see it as quite the opposite of decentralized. If anything, it it's centralizing. It's bureaucratic in the sense that there's like a, a process around governance uh, for making changes or allocating funds. Uh, and it, mm -hmm. I guess it, it is an organization, whereas like a fandom is not really an organization. So in practice, a lot of what we do today in like today's form, 2021 form of DAOs, like what you find on Juicebox, Mirror, et cetera, is often actually like, uh, I, I visualize it as like, if a fandom is like this really large amorphous thing, a DAO in its current structure is kind of like a, like a belt around the center of the fandom that's kind of squeezing uh, so that all governance has to pass through a single bureaucratic organization or process at the center. Yeah. So in a yeah, way, exactly. the, the decentralization is like, so if you really are interested, and this is kind of my reflection on the loot, uh, sort of governance crisis, brief governance crisis, where there was a, a move to try to make AGLD into the governance token for the loot community, uh, which mm -hmm. went back and forth for a little bit and ultimately resolved to Dom writing a proposal that was passed by loot holders directly uh, to burn the keys to the loot contract. 
I, I think Fred Ersom also has a post on this. It's like minimum viable, mi minimum viable governance. Like you actually want as little governance as possible where possible, or at mm -hmm. least that's one way to approach DAOs is to just get rid of all of the governance. Because at the end of the day, we don't all want to be governing everything all the time. The best systems are the ones where they work smoothly without governance. So I'm very interested yeah. to bring this mm -hmm. back to what you were talking about is to think about how can we have structures like maybe DJVs, I don't know, uh, or splits or other forms of sort of collaboration on the blockchain that allows for us to not require to, uh, engaging a lawyer or writing any kind of contract, but nevertheless share in uh, some kind of project. And maybe even, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you allow me to think of DAOs in this way, maybe even think about DAOs that are created and resolved within the space of a block. You know, if we don't need to have a enduring organization, then ideally we don't, if we can get done what we need to without it. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, I think, it, like, people are always talking about how you can, like, be employed by a DAO. It's like, no, like, I do not want... Oh, maybe another phone call. Oh, you there, Ellie? Okay, well, we'll wait a second for Ellie to come back. Yeah, if you haven't seen that Brad Trammell video, I don't think it's floating around on the internet just yet. I think it's... Uh not token gated, USD gated on uh, his Patreon. The second half is really, really not very good. But the first half uh, I found extremely interesting in terms of like what created the conditions for certain parts of the NFT boom to happen. And just in general, like how do we contextualize this thing? I, I find it's kind of strange that NFTs have become, but by many people, especially people who aren't actually in the scene, NFTs are seen as as strictly fine art, fine art objects or art collectible art objects. But to me, as a developer and just someone, you know, try and think kind of broadly about it, NFT is it's just a it's not even a data structure. It's a it's a concept, uh, and it has a certain kind of implementation in Ethereum. But it looks different on different protocols. Flow NFTs look different. Tezos NFTs look different. And at the end of the day, they're just sort of uh, a practical way of distinguishing uh, a certain kind of data structure from a fungible token. So for instance, one weird form of NFT is a, a juice box project. A juice box project itself is represented by an NFT and the wallet that holds that NFT is able to modify the funding cycle parameters for juice box. So in that case, the NFT is obviously not a fine art object. It's something quite different. Uh, Ellie, welcome back. Hey, sorry. That's okay. Technical difficulties. Apparently, don't let your phone accept phone calls when you're talking. I know. Um, we all have to figure out how to use that focus thing in the new iOS. It's too complicated. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the last thing, like, luckily, my, Maz was in the room and she realized I, and she told me that no one could hear what I was saying. But um, <laughs> yeah, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, oh, geez. I don't know. Um, I think we were talking about sort of DAOs that can resolve quickly. I don't, I don't know that we got too far into your remarks. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was just trying to say that ideally we're all not owned by DAOs in like a sense that like we don't work for DAOs. Like I don't want oh, yeah. to be employed by a DAO. No, you're a contributor in a DAO. You're to... not an employee of the DAO. Yeah. It was just like, I don't want to like, I think like, governing organizations like result in people wanting to like accrue power to then exert their power over other people and i think like the beauty of web3 is that we are like we can become truly sovereign individuals and rely on infrastructure that isn't i guess like you know controlled by in theory like it wouldn't be controlled by people who essentially want that control i like to tell people that like the true innovation in crypto networks isn't, you know, that we can have digital money. It's that we can have like scarcity and like an assurance of accuracy of like digital records, you know, without the use of violence or a monopoly on force or violence, you know? So like traditionally like governments use their monopoly on force to essentially convince someone that like a dollar is, is like worth something and that, you know, it's the threat of their military that supposedly makes that dollar, you know, worth something. But now we can use crypto networks that are backed by mathematics and like advanced cryptography. And that's like obviously powerful. So like, why do we need to replicate these structures of governance and sort of like trickle up ownership? And that's like sort of just like what I feel strongly about that we need to avoid in this space, you know, like, like I, I personally am like motivated just by like the possibility that like I can contribute to the betterment of like so many people, but like I don't have to put myself in a position of like 
power over other people you know even just like me becoming a a co-founder of like a traditional corporation like people who work for this company that i always online inc you know the the corporate side of like the dual dow corporate parallel structure yeah. like technically i will like there will be like a power imbalance between myself as like a founder with like who runs the payroll and all that stuff you know like because people do need to sure, get sure. hpi and all that stuff but like i think like we can increasingly like make systems that don't require our fallible selves to or the systems we create to have like a power over other people you know and that's i feel like just something that isn't talked about enough in this space like one of the reasons i feel so strongly about not having DAOs be like where the value accumulates is because increasingly the people they're just like over time the people that will continue to benefit are the people that were able to take the risks early and like kickstart a venture and then they backfill the actual like value and like wealth generation with the labor of those who are seeking an opportunity you know right and the thing is like you know it frustrates me that all of these like hundred million dollar protocols are encouraging these contributors to like do bounties and and get tokens when the people who you know sure had the idea like are the ones making millions of dollars because they wouldn't be there without the people that like actually are continuing to run the organization. Well, I, I think so, I think even more than I mean I totally agree with you. Although I, um, it's hard to come up with a calculation of who deserves what. Really, I mean, does anyone deserve anything? We're all sort of born into this universe <laughs> without being responsible for any of it. But you know, I think that where it hits the pavement is going to be in how do you convince people to who are excellent to spend time building out the 15th feature of your protocol when if the founders are not involved or if, if early contributors are have already made so much money by uh, liquidating the token without any kind of lockup or something. You know, one thing that's interesting about uh, Web3, uh, the crypto side of Web3, especially as opposed to everything else. And actually, one of the things that interested me most about it was not so much the exit opportunity or, or the lack of lockups, but but that, you know, I was looking at Roblox for years, wanting to invest in Roblox just as a, you know, you know, person with a regular day job, collecting a little bit of money in savings and wanting to put it somewhere smart. But I just couldn't invest in Roblox until so far down their history. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah. crypto, at least for now, enables that. And, and on the other side, it also, in general, allows people to sell their tokens uh, relatively early. Depends. There's some, obviously, some protocols and, and DAOs do, do lockups, but many don't. So, yeah, I think the big problem for DAOs is going to be how do you how do you keep going? How do you keep the enthusiasm? Everybody wants the when it's new and when the token is pumping initially, um, but how do you keep the excitement up over time? Well, yeah, I think it's just I've said this before. Someone tweeted out and quote tweeted me or something, but... Like, I think DAOs are meant to die. Like, I don't think, <laughs> like, unlike corporations that seem to try to live forever, like, I think the best DAOs will be ones that don't live forever, mm. that, like, you know, shut down when they've lost that energy. And I think, like, the ultimate plan is to just, like, have the groups, like, have groups of people, whether online or in person, like, that you like to hang out with and you like to work with, and then do work with them, like, you know, make a living but like ideally, you know, these like corporation esque DAOs are not like not where people have allegiance to. Like I think like one of the reasons Web three is great is because like you can just as more freely associate yourselves with awesome people. You know, I see like I'm just like looking at the people who are listening in. Like I would consider all the people that I know like you're all my friends, and like the fact that like we're building a new, hopefully more good for everyone world together it's like fucking dope i'm loyal to all of you i'm not loyal to whatever like fucking DAOs were a part of you know like DAOs are DAOs are a means to like serve us you know we don't serve DAOs mm -hmm. in the same way that we don't serve corporations that came before us or governments you know so i just like think we need to get away from this idea that DAOs are like the actual driver between from all of this, you know? Right, right, like, right. They're I'm coordination starting, tools. They're not the ends. Yeah, they're memes, you know? Like, DAOs are, like, memes that, like, focus us towards, like, some North Star for an initiative. But, like, that's not, like, that's not what, like, that's, like, just, it's just a, it's a utility, you know? Like, I think the best crypto-native organizations are just going to be, like, group chats, you know? 
Yes, the individuals like, that we're meeting today that are going to be here in 20 years, but maybe not all of the DAOs. This is actually why I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of like um, speculative games on governance tokens for protocols, because it feels mm -hmm. to me like they're, and I, when, when I think about this for governance for juice box, et cetera, it's, it's like, how do you make sure if you have a DAO stewarding a software project like a protocol development, how do you make sure that the DAO doesn't end up uh, primarily serving its own interests as a DAO rather than the protocol it was created to steward? And how, well, how, yeah, that's how, what, how can you that's, get to a point that, where that, like the DAO can actually go away? Like if you st stand up a protocol and eventually the protocol is like open source on-chain software, doesn't require maintenance after a certain point, you know, the DAO should be able to either change its purpose, return the money or just, just go away one way or the other, you know, well, why, why stick around? Thing, like you're, you're, you're saying that the DAO is like stewarding the protocol. No, the DAO is like essentially a container that helps like coordinate the people to serve the protocol you know i feel like we're we're losing fact of the that like it's the individuals that are like actually the ones who are making all this happen and like i think it's actually unethical for a dao or a corporation to exist and hold captive like people via like essentially economic incentives because like think of all of like the so-called zombie corporations like i would even argue just think of like corporations in general that like pay people money to stay there and waste away their potential because they are trying to like, they're essentially like harvesting the life of like people who are getting paid. They're making a trade and the corporation is trying to like increase its longevity yeah. so it can perpetuate its existence, but it doesn't actually have a reason to exist. So I think like in web three, we can actually create a future where like organizations don't exist past their point of like of the reason they need to exist you know and that's why it's like i'm long people not DAOs or like i just i think people in general want communities but we don't want like these entities that we have to like you know trade our labor for money you know absolutely the, the, the DAO, like a doubt you know we have a the DAO is the people the DAO is the people there there should not be uh something that exists the token holders are the ones who constitute the DAO and the DAO existing separate from those token holders it shouldn't really be. Yeah, it's just, it's the problem of like, you know, uh, like token-based weighting of like uh, go go governance, like uh, voice, you know, like I really think like, I don't really believe in, um, in like uh, sort of token balances being like the weight of voting. Sure, it's just um, difficult to like, to figure out you know, the civil resistance problem is difficult otherwise, or even with that. Yeah, but difficult. I mean, we've solved lots of stuff. Like, imagine if we just, like, said we weren't going to put up with token-based voting anymore. I'm pretty sure we'd solve it, you know. Might is look like really WorldCoin, it? though. Uh, I mean, not if I have anything to say about <laughs> it. But, um, you know, like, we don't need anyone scanning our eyeballs, and we don't need especially Sam Altman scanning our eyeballs. I guess, like, you know, to any, like, what if, like, how do you uh, solve this problem? We've all solved lots of fucking things as, as humans on this earth. And sometimes, you know, we've solved things in the name of like some pretty bad stuff. So like, let's like start solving things for, you know, the benefit of everyone. And I just think like this pessimism that exists, like think of even just like tokens in general, some random people came up with the, like the ERC 20 yeah. proposal and it took off like, we're just a bunch of random people. What For sure. I, come I, up with, you know? I'd be curious to know, you know, I know there's skepticism and I, I'm fully on board with skepticism around tokens as the voting mechanism. Uh, I know Vitalik has written about it, but I, I'm not sure how you manage to get beyond that without some kind of reputation system, you know, some identifying people, essentially, who's a human, who, who counts, uh, what address it counts. Uh, but anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, ideally, like, I mean, I don't think there should be some person or some group of people that can decide that so obviously it is hard like we don't want some authority that's deciding. a credit, credit bureau on the blockchain yeah fuck that um, fuck that yes uh, so, okay but I, um, I don't mean to change the topic but aol tell me tell yeah. me so what you described it earlier it sounded to me a lot of people ask oh i wish someone would reinvent tumblr on the blockchain where's tumblr where's tumblr is that a reasonable way exactly. to talk about it or tell me um, tell me why that's wrong yeah hopefully someone could leverage like the technology that like AOL is going to put out there to build like a web three Tumblr, you know, but I, I more view it as an infrastructure play, both on the software and physical hardware layer mixed with, you know, a brand and a metaphysical space on the internet. 
via AOL.xyz to actually bring all of this stuff together. So one of the reasons, like, you know, I talk so much about uh, DJVs on this, like, spaces so far is, like, I'm actually really excited about using DJVs to build to build all of the, like, functionality that I want to exist on AOL.xyz. And to be clear, AOL.xyz is not going to be something that's, like, owned by some corporation. Like, ideally, we even, like, figure out how to make decentralized DNS so that literally a corporation doesn't own the servers. So w- that, would you say that you this know, is power. in the neighborhood of like Urbit then? I mean, Urbit is too complicated. So <laughs> no, but like, yeah, I mean, maybe. I just think it's bad that AWS and Microsoft and Facebook own so much of the actual physical underlying infrastructure. And then they also own so much of like, the internet application guess, layer substrate. Yeah. yeah application layer that powers all the software experiences you know like and i want to like figure out how to like almost leverage the like corporate structures that exist in this world that like have been essentially lobbied into existence by like corporations over the years and use that to our advantage to like accumulate i guess like a physical presence you know like ideally like the goal eventually is to have AOL coordinate installing installment of uh of undersea cables that like have internet go across continents instead of cables that are owned by conglomerate consortiums of like facebook and and google and microsoft i love it so you're saying some kind of like fomo ramp using the fomo ramp techniques built up by startup culture etc vc culture to uh maybe propel some kind of web3 infrastructure uh into existence yeah, I mean, I'm kind of just planning on tackling it from all angles. Like, like ideally, you know, like there are tangible benefits from like a complexity boundary as like a user to use like software that's like bundled. You know, like it's nice that like with G Suite, I kind of, you know, know that using a spreadsheet, a Google Sheets or using a Docs is going to have like a similar experience. I can log in with one account. But like I don't like that Google is the only one that can like really change that. You know, they have, they have, like, plugins and stuff. But, like, imagine if you could go to AOL.xyz and have, like, the best, like, experience and, like, the best productivity suite or, like, the best calendar and email. You know, you have, like, AOL mail, but it's, like, it's not built by some single corporation. It's not even built by one single DAO. It's, like, a truly collectively owned public good that, like, can be powered by squads or guilds of groups of people Mm -hmm. even built by DAOs. you know it's not it's like it's like a it's kind of like no one owns water you know on this planet it's like a renewal it's a resource that is like for us like we're blessed with water but then nestle fucking wants to say they own water and they want to say they can charge you to access that resource you know so i'm just trying to like really think about how like we can get to a point where like the internet, this thing that like is increasingly central to our lives is like actually like for the people, by the people. Awesome. I I see some people are interested in talking and I'll I'll invite some people up to ask questions if you have time, Ellie. But uh, before that, I wanted to ask, uh, you gave me a little preview of some of the hardware stuff you're thinking about. Is that something you're at liberty to talk about or would you rather wait? Uh, I would, that's kind of like the secret stuff. Okay, okay, we we don't need to get into it. yeah, I mean, ideally, once we figure out a way to make it so, like, for-profit corporations can't steal it, the Perfect, innovations, yeah. then, then I'll gladly share it with the world. Awesome. But, okay, we'll have to do a follow-up episode. So uh, I got a couple people I'm going to invite up. Also, I see Danny, Chaim, Dai, a bunch of cool people around. Uh, Stefan, uh, if any of you uh, want to ask a question or just say something, feel free. Let me bring up Katie. Hey, Katie, welcome. Uh, do you have a question or an idea? Hey, hey, Ellie. Um, I just hey, love what you're talking about with with um, water and how that's just such a good metaphor. Um, and we're living in an age right now where data is the most important asset. Yet there are all these huge companies that are like secretly, you know, storing all of that data and using it um, and figuring out ways to creatively do that. And I'm just curious about how we as creators and how we in this like ownership economy can create revenue streams for ourselves in ethical ways that actually promote Mm -hmm. a better power structure for everyone. Um, It's something that I really want to think about um, as we build a better world. And I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's a great point. 
I mean, this is something I've like thought about for a long time before, like even just like before I was thinking about in like a Web3 crypto way, but like the idea of like how can you like have service providers, businesses that like build software and make it useful to like the end user without like without them like getting an unfair advantage because they like process your data. And I think that's where like the architecture of hopefully like what will become like the AOL always online network will like make it possible. We, we're seeing this a bit with, I guess, with like, you know, Ethereum, like in DeFi, like because like all the data is like public and out there, there's no one really has a competitive advantage, at least compared to like private processing and ownership of data that's produced. Like anyone can remix it. So therefore it's like kind of like a level playing field. But what if like you could take it a step further where an individual user can kind of have their own data vault that like is like their unique data and like no one can access it from a like I guess no one can hoard it and basically claim ownership of you know your data but they can uh, essentially you can use software that they've written to like I guess make your own data useful in a secure container um, somewhere on the internet that like you control so like, you could imagine that like let's just say like I have I'm like a software vendor and I wrote a program that can securely add up numbers together. We can call it a calculator. And I want to like offer this service to people in the olden days. Maybe like I would benefit from knowing like the numbers that were added together. And I also don't want to have other people know the numbers that are being calculated either. Because as a provider, I think people should be able to keep the numbers that they have like essentially private so obviously one simple solution would be to have a calculator people can download and you know process it locally and that's good for a lot of stuff but like what if you know it requires like the data of other people or like requires like computers that are too powerful to run on a phone like there's always different edge cases where you may need to like put something uh in the cloud i guess so what if you could make it where I as a developer could develop the software, but then Katie as a user can go and submit m numbers to be calculated and be processed in a secure enclave in this network and then return to her and be end-to-end -end encrypted and then updated in her own personal data vault. That's like kind of the idea of how I see, I guess, software providers evolving into the future. And no one's really like solved like, the logistics of that yet but that's kind of like what i feel like i've figured out how to do and that's like why i'm raising money and working with maz and like building up a team that's the secret thing i forgot i shouldn't have said because i think there's some rule where you can't say you're raising money but since i said it signed to me at my dms if you want to put it on that. <laughs> uh okay well now it's SEC definitely uh... was hopefully <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't in the chat. SEC.xyz. Uh, JAO7, what's up? Hey, y'all. Um, really enjoyed this Hello. conversation, Ellie. Thank you so much for the insights and just kind of sharing your thoughts here. I think, um, you know, I think uh, the type of Web3 that you envision is one that I think I certainly subscribe to. And um, I just really got my mind kind of jarred here around the idea of like ephemerality and DAOs and um, DJVs and kind of, it's interesting to see how quickly the idea of like DAOs and collective ownership and coordination is becoming more and more nuanced um, and mm -hmm. sort of branching off. It's like this, it, it truly feels like this organism type of thing where it's like just budding off into different things. But um, I just had a couple, one or two questions. One is sure. just, one is just uh, simple. Is like your cover photo is that? I don't know why I'm asking this, but it just really I have a personal memory attached to it. As well as well, is that it, it? reminds me of Team Labs in Tokyo, the Borderless exhibit, and I just don't know if that's that was what it was. But I was just curious for that. Yeah, um, good question. It was actually second, um, yeah, yeah, it was in Singapore um, at this like it maybe it was like a similar exhibit, like a traveling exhibit, but it was at it was in Singapore, like at some like installation i don't know exactly where i don't remember where i think it, was, it might be the team labs one because i do know that they have one in Singapore as well yeah it was really cool you kind of like walked through um, it and it was this, so that's, like, that's just kind sort of a cool sort of yeah it was like thing. this mirror based thing but yeah like lights and was yeah. there like music 
music too and stuff kind of yeah this whole yeah. like I mean, it was really, it was uh, interstellar cool. vibe going on and stuff yeah yeah so maybe it was <laughs> yeah absolutely maybe. good cool. eye. My, my second question is um just around the idea of like creating this brand uh aol i think one thing that's kind of struck me you know in this web3 space is that like there's just what i love about it just the intergenerationality i guess there's there's folks who like came online mm-hmm. web2 there's folks who most of i think folks came in kind of like web2 kind of social you know post sort of like not post but like the, the at the height of facebook right and mm-hmm. then there's some i think myself included who was kind of around connected around like 1.0 Oh, web 1.0, maybe even like, well, if we want to kind of delineate, uh, but you know, it's certainly like I was around during AOL, the original AOL America online. Yeah. So I just find it uh-huh. funny and full circle and kind of AOL. What's that? We've never heard of it. I mean, cheap, but just <laughs> curious, like, you know, what was the idea behind that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's like talking to people and also being like a bit nostalgic for the internet before it became owned. And although ironically, AOL by, like, would be your nightmare. I think actual AOL keep paid keywords and such. Yeah, oh, yeah exactly. Well, yeah. well that's so like, well, that's there. why it's kind of funny, you know, like, I feel like that I was think, when the internet got really messed up. Yeah. But I think like it's, yeah, that, that is true. Um, but I think like, because it sort of was like rose to prominence in that time, like it sort of takes people back. And I think like, I'm always someone who likes to subvert expectations in terms of branding and like, I guess, um, leverage, uh, something that like people think is going to go one way and then um, make it repurpose it into something that's like sort of the opposite. So one of like my goals of AOL is like, you know, the name, but also just like harkens back to like, like it's always online. Like I, I kind of want it to feel like almost like a parody of, I don't know, like a dot com era, like company or like sort of like, you know, a bit of a, you know, like you think about like, yeah, I just, I think it's like, I, you know, I'm get, we're still working on like fully articulating it, but just this sort of vibe that like, you know, you think about um, kind of like American consumerism and excess, like, and just like multinational corporations. Like, I, I think it's interesting that you could almost like leverage that excess and like try to like use it, use that like vibe to almost like make it not necessary um, in the same way that like, you know, pool suite FM is sort of leveraging and like repurposing sort of like early 90s like business slash like executive vibe you know if anything this is almost like trying to reclaim like the internet that was i guess taken over by like corporations that tried to like repackage it and repurpose it but at the same time like i think aol was useful for a large group of people who weren't extremely online like my mom used aol and uh it That's really a great was point. like a good like on ramp consumer friendly to the internet. It was a it was a curated um subset slice of the internet. But I think that's the beauty of like, you know, what we're we could curate. Like I think like we're all tastemakers in this space and I think like um we could really create like a, a place that's easy for like everyone to sort of hop in and like start using web three um in like a single place but have it be curated in like a decentralized fashion so i know that was like a lot there but it was a really good question you know it was, it was intentional definitely like the nostalgia factor like there was actually this article that i'm gonna try and like share that i like that like i need to read still so if it's shit i'm sorry but um <laughs> actually talks about like nostalgia of some new yorker thing but it's called like pokemon and the first wave of digital nostalgia it says A pixel art revival is pushing back against the dull slickness of social media and building a new internet aesthetic from the old. So, yeah, it's kind of just like this vibe, I guess, and it resonates with me. Obviously, like, I'm I'm 27, so it's like kind of that era. I'm going to try and share this link. Cool. Uh, I'll retweet it if uh, if you don't make it. Uh, Jay, uh, do you have a, I guess, is the last question quick? Because I want to let someone else ask some questions. No, too. no more questions. I just want to say that's awesome. I love it. I love the idea of that kind of like flipping it on its head. I think there's such a strong story and like richness to that. So appreciate you saying Yeah, that. thanks. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Perina. Anyone else? Hi. First of all, I love this conversation so much. And Ellie, we definitely need to talk more because even the whole like, concept of AOL and everything 
I've been like messing around with like smart contracts and stuff and been thinking about something very similar. So this is like so cool. But my question is kind of like related to a point that you brought up super early in the chat about kind of balancing currently like working with a corporation and a company because of like funding and things like that. There are some like pros of that kind of centralized system just in the beginning and then also having Mm -hmm. a DAO on the side. And that is actually like, a dynamic that's like been an issue for me lately with working Mm -hmm. with some ideas because I don't know, like because of the whole like web three push on like decentralization and just like the whole, I I definitely have this, like, it feels like a little bit of a guilt of being like, okay, is working with like a company or like doing some sort of thing like that while having the DAO kind of like selling out. So I don't know if you feel the same way, but like just grappling like yeah. figuring out that dynamic how do you feel like that's going or like how did you figure out what the right balance is if that makes sense yeah no that's that's a great question and like something i think a lot about i mean even like the idea of like accepting money from venture capitalists like or just like people with money like that always feels a bit weird too mm-hmm. because you know like morally like i want to like jump to this world where like everyone has the same shot at everything but like obviously like as trying to think about things pragmatically it's useful to like get like do a pre-seed raise and like be able to like have the resources to do things the right way and everything um so i mean to your point of i guess your point of concern about is it selling out to like you know be employed by a corporation or well you're also building a DAO. my personal view is no because especially depending on where you live, health insurance is fucking expensive. Corporations have an unfair advantage, you know, over decades of lobbying that have resulted in like, you know, corporations legally being able to like get cheaper rates on health insurance. There's like literal advantages to being a employee versus being an independent contractor. There's so many things that are stacked against us in 2021 that, I think anyone who tries to shame anyone into like anyone who tries to shame anyone for working for a corporation, you know, while also doing DAO things is not really thinking about things in the right way. I think that my like I guess balanced approach to dealing with this is to make a corporation that doesn't look like a typical corporation. So like one of the, you know, pieces of I guess like You know, the core team, like, if they want to, they can be, like, employed by AOL, the corporation. Like, we already have, like, six of us who are, you know, some of them are in this call who are going to be, I guess, like, getting a paycheck from AOL or Always Online Inc. One of the things that, like, as I guess, like, the co-founder of that Inc. or corporation is, like, I can be like, yo, the, the work week is 32 hours a week because fuck, like, working, like, 70 hours a week at some job. Like we're all um we're all multifaceted. We all have like lives outside of like our jobs. Like so it's like because like, you know, we're creating this in real time, like just because like conventions exist in like entities that are traditionally structured as corporations doesn't mean that we have to follow any of them. So I think mm-hmm. that's like my answer to trying to like make it work. Perina, yeah. I'm curious, what, that- what was the specific or I don't know how specific you can be, but what, what's difficult about doing working corporate and DAO at the same time? I guess the area where I'm really struggling in is because, sorry, I have like my roommates are talking. That's um, okay. Because uh, we're working on like an infrastructure, like Ellie, you're talking about like AOL. And like, uh, I really do agree with the fact, like the whole value of making sure that at the end of the day, the end goal is that everyone owns this infrastructure like anyone who's on the internet and people can create from any place so i think that whole fear of like selling out to me is figuring out just in the beginning if a company is making this infrastructure how do we like use the DAO to kind of make sure that like at the end of the day as we start building more and more on top of this you know it is yeah. something that everyone mm-hmm. can own and like what is the fine line because if it is then something that everyone can own why not just keep it a doubt right but then of course like you said there are pros yeah. to having the company thing benefits etc and like there is a core team that starts off always so mm-hmm. i don't know i think that's yeah. why just because the infrastructure part i'm like 
uh, grappling with it. Like trying to decide, you're trying to decide what it, whether it can become if it has to be down. And, and frankly, I don't think that just being a down native is going to do it. Yeah, no, that's a really good clarification. And thanks for like additional context. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't claim to have all of the answers. I, we're still figuring out like the best way to, I guess, ideally going back to like value accrual. I think perhaps the way you know you solve it is you make it so I guess like the initial people who put up like the capital are rewarded, but then also like the people I guess use that capital to you know and refine it into the solution are rewarded. But then I guess like ideally the ultimate like you know once the infrastructure is in place, it's sort of like a public good and like just thinking about like the maintenance of public goods as we think about them like you know governments like like i don't know there's thing about like central park like i think maybe the city of new york new york technically owns it but like we try to like as a society like make central park like a thing that like all people can just go and like take a stroll in the park so i think like there's probably going to be like people who like groups of people like a DAO, a DAO could like i imagine a DAO will eventually like maintain like there could be a single DAO that's like a group of people that you know are going to maintain like a data center in like the AOL network but I think it's really just we want to avoid this like idea that like there's like passive stakeholders that can like perpetually like increase their power just because they like happen to like have the money to buy it I don't know it's really complicated but I think like compared to even like 10 years ago we have so many more tools to to try and take a like chip away at this problem space so i think it's just like we have to really just be intentional about it you know like i'm going to be intentional mm-hmm. about how i like navigate having a corporate structure and also a dao like also like like when i say i like like ideally the dao is like doesn't have really anything to do with like me and maz you know like obviously we could be like participants, but we're like on ideally on the same footing as like anyone else, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, that really does help clarify because I like I kind of was dealing with the problem exactly as how you were describing it. With the only part that was kind of confusing for me is like if a company is starting out with like building the infrastructure, isn't that almost like centralization because they own all the source code, they own everything, they can make the decision. And that yeah. is the goal. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Just ideally, like, there could be easy ways where I guess the company doesn't own the source code. It can, like, maybe get, like, a royalty or, like, sort of benefit, like, from the resulting network that's created. But, like, ideally, like, mm-hmm. it's, like, more public. Um, we actually were talking about this in, like, a call earlier today with relating to, like, decentralized joint ventures, which was, like, you know, I was talking about for a lot on this call. And, like, Mm -hmm. I think, like, that's going to, like, sort of play a part is, like, ideally, like, it's more, like, how do we just, like, keep momentum going and, like, fund all of us to build these things that, like, are generally helpful. Um, But then, like, once things are in motion, ideally, like, they can stay in motion. Yeah. Because, like, there are, like, people who own Ethereum and, like, you know, those people can benefit from, like, the work that's done to, like, keep Ethereum online. But, like, I think that's a good example of, like, a network that's not just owned by like investors but obviously like i mean like if i was like independently wealthy like i would already like i would just like fund this and like not even go like in like a investor route but like i think like as long as we figure out a way to sort of like make everyone happy i guess you know i know it's kind of maybe a little bit idealistic but that's just like the way i'm thinking about things no, that Ellie, totally I have sense. another um, follow-up question about um, DeFi and how DeFi is kind of like recollecting a lot of the financial power. Um, yeah. How how can we like? Because like I'm <laughs> Ellie, answer for the sins on, like, of DeFi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do we do about DeFi, Ellie? I mean, kind of. No, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. No, it's a good. That's a great it's question. Um, <laughs> That's a good question. What's what's the answer, yeah, Ellie? I, Tell us. <laughs> I mean, I think about that too. Like, I think that's sort of like why, um, you know, I I just don't like, I mean, I'm always like a skeptic when it comes to like interest rates in general, you know, like 
ever since I was a kid, I'm like, how can you make money out of money? You know? So, uh, I think the fact that we've like digitized this and like made it on chain, you know, it's just like kind of, it's kind of a mess. So I think that's like sort of why I'm just like lately I've been focusing on like actually like thinking about what do we need as like people to actually thrive and not just survive. Uh, so I think the solution to that is like, you know, obviously benefit when we can from like this DeFi situation. If like we're going to be able to like get like some like hundred thousand percent APY or something, sure, let's like try to like use it. More importantly, let's like try to build systems both fit both fit both physical and digital that actually like provide for the needs of people on this planet you know like i was talking to some people about i mean I'm talking to a lot of people about you know what what's the results of like building these like data centers that could exist like you could actually have communities you know like you could create jobs and not like facebook creating jobs for people since like you could actually have communities that are like powered by you know renewable energy that are like serving like the local people who live where that physical space is, but also like powering, you know, digital infrastructure and experiences that help us run our lives. And I think like that's kind of the answer to like how I would approach like, you know, not repeating the same, you know, power dynamics. It's like people want to accumulate a lot of tokens. It's like, like what if we just make it so like, you know, those don't really get you access to things. Like, I just like, you know, the reason people want tokens is because they can like exchange them for ETH and then they can exchange them for fiat so then they can buy things, you know? Like, we can have other paths to uh, providing like, you know, ownership or not even ownership, like fuck ownership. Yeah, fuck ownership. Providing. There are things native to Ethereum that people already want, but I don't, it's not clear. I mean, one of the reasons that I, I jumped into Web3 with such uh, speed was because, you know, it took a long time. It took like three years between the launch of Mosaic Browser and the banner ad being invented at Wired Magazine. So it's like the existence of the economic built into blockchains from day zero means that it's it's moving much faster. So it's not like, yeah. it, basically, there's a lot of nice ideas out there that don't get traction because they don't have a viability mechanism, f- finance being just one of them. You know, like mm-hmm. memes, memes are a non-financial, uh, like uh, reproducing through time kind of organism. Mm-hmm. So it's like a mixed bag with DeFi. Uh, it's not just like the, the existence of DeFi is also the reason why NFTs are important and more than, more than just JPEGs. So it's just complicated. Yeah, but like also though, like let's be real, like most people on this planet who are alive now are hardwired to think about our existence in terms of how it's been done in like the last like i don't know 60 years you know like if you think about like even 500 years ago countries didn't really exist you didn't have credit scores you didn't have you know like it's just like people need to like i guess literally like think outside their minds and like you know fathom like uh entirely new ways of like creating i don't know lives like in conditions that we all can thrive in you know like i i like to say that like i'm building for my future self and my future self you know is going to be doing things that i can't even fathom you know and i think that's like what we need to just start being really cognizant of is like we think that we need like money in the traditional sense we think we need like loans and all these like different things but like think of like just like the fact that all of us can be chilling out here with these like things that like these phones like that like sort of happen because a lot of it happened because there's profit motives but like what happens when you can sort of remove the like profit motive in the traditional sense and you sort of then you sort of start creating these like abundant focused systems that are like able to function not because they need to like you know have a return on investment but because they sort of you know exist to like make other things exist so Um, Again, I don't claim to have the answers. Like my present day self, again, is trying to make my future self do these things. Um, I'm just saying that like my goal as like, I don't know, in in this space is to basically put things out there that enable these new ways of like existing as a society that are like more equitable and more favorable. Like I really just like feel strongly that like I don't want people to feel like they, they have to like do things without like 
truly like wanting to do things like like i think like the existing way the world works is like based on coercion like there's people that can like uh, essentially like if you have a certain like if you're like if you have enough money that gives you like autonomy to exist and then decide what you want to do but anyone who's not financially independent uh doesn't have that privilege and um i've like i guess this year you know one point i had literally like zero dollars this year and you know luckily i actually happened to get like an airdrop from like the gitcoin airdrop because i had used gitcoin over the years so it's like that was like how i was able to like pay for food in the real world like that was just like a mechanism that didn't exist a few years ago so like what are other mechanisms that we can like create where like you know we're not just like you know economic agents that are like you know making trades with people we're more just like people that we should all like be like trying to lift up and make it so we all have a good time like my voice is kind of getting tired because i've been talking for a while but i really think like if anything like we're at this point in history where we can coordinate the shit out of this stuff and we can live in an abundant society and anyone who says that you can't, they just want to keep that abundant society that they live into to themselves for whatever reason. They're just selfish, you know? Like, I, I know that, like, life like, is really hard for a lot of people. And I know in some ways, like, you know, people have more than other stuff. But, like, like I just believe, like, that if we can, like, chip away at all of these problems, like, then we can really start getting a headway and yeah, I just like I'm skeptical of anyone who says that like this stuff isn't possible. Yeah, that's kind of like my end of talking because it's late. Yeah, and yeah. You get please, food. please. Uh, but, I'm gonna hang out for a little bit if uh, people want to keep talking. Jade uh, and I see Danny is also around. I'd love to hear from both of you. But Ellie, thanks so much for coming and chatting today. It's been awesome. Yeah, totally. Thanks everyone for um, listening and put it up with my long rants, but uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Appreciate you have to come back when you can you. spill all the beans, all the secrets. Uh, oh yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to like just anyone who's interested in learning more, slide into my DMS. Well, put. Probably well already put. Been there, so. <laughs> very yeah. compliant way of putting it. Uh, all right. Thanks. All right. Have a good evening. Yeah. Bye. See you. Um, yeah. So Jade uh, wanted to say something and, Oh, I'm going to bring Danny up also. Jade, go for it. All right, I guess maybe the person you wanted to ask a question just left. <laughs> Ellie's yeah, gone. I was actually going to ask a question about oh, um, sorry. translating that amazing business idea to like tech people, but it's okay. Don't it's tell okay. me, tell me, tell me. I'll you know, make sure to follow you so I can. Yeah, we got some other her. brains around if you want to shoot the shit with people mm -hmm. other than Ellie. Uh, but if not, no problem. <laughs> yeah, I know. So um, I know Ellie is working in tech currently and there's some big rife between uh, tech and like web two and web three. And I was just wondering if anyone here has like seen that and announcing these projects, how have they dealt with that conflict? So you're saying announcing a web three project and how web two people will perceive it or vice versa? Yes. Okay. So web, how, you're doing some, okay. So NFT hate, would that be a good summary? Yeah. NFT hate is a great way to summarize that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, this is a great question. I am helping out through a strange sequence of events, a uh, very large, I got in touch with a very large influencer and kind of convinced them to try to do an NFT thing. And they're getting a lot of hate <laughs> about it. So I'm actually thinking about this also lately. Honestly, I don't have a great answer. I wonder if Danny has any good, good ideas. I mean, I feel like a lot of people, you know, I spent, when I first came into Web3 stuff in a serious way, really focusing like all my time on it in end of 2020, early 2021, I talked about it and I got such feet, such hateful feedback from some people. I remember one particular person, very smart person who I got into a real like personal fight with uh, over this, uh, someone who works for Google actually and was very critical of the ecological impact of NFTs and how uh, crypto isn't good for anything, has no actual use case. It's, you know, uh, whatever it is, it's just, it's not worth uh, the ecological damage. And this actually happened coming around again today. There's a, a post going around by an artist who does an analysis of the ecological impact of uh, the current state of Ethereum. Um, and basically, I, I, this is not a good answer to your question, but what I'll tell you, my perspective on it, which is that like learning new things is painful, 
because you have to become the kind of person who understands that thing that you didn't previously. So you have to become a new kind of person, different from what you were before. And some things look really complicated. Some things tweak us because they disagree with our identity from our current self. And some things tweak us because they're, they look too complicated and we don't feel like we should be forced by society to deal with the labor of learning and incorporating these new ideas into our identity. And so at the end of the day, what I kind of found through these conversations was like, and I, God bless the people who are willing to have these slow conversations, but I was reminded of my father maybe six or seven years ago saying to me, um, why would I text when I could just call? Uh, this is before he had an iPhone. Of course, now he has an iPhone and, and texts all the time. But the point is like arguing with him about or like trying to coach him into understanding why he might want to text was not ever going to convince him to text. And I don't give a shit if he texts. Please don't text if you don't want to. I don't care. So I think at, on some level, like there, there becomes a cultural divide, which I, was how I first interpreted your question, that Web3 people almost erect a wall between Web3 and Web2 or, or somehow are telling Web2 people implicitly, like you are the past uh, grandpa, but which is obviously not a great way to start a conversation. But actually, I think part of that is almost like a I want to say it in French, cicatrice, like a like a scarring or a, you know a reaction to to how um, many people treat people who are interested in NFTs, among other things. NFTs just being the most visible. So, are you are you looking to explain this to your your Web two friends and fans? Is that the is that the challenge? Mm -hmm. Um, something like that. One of the projects that I'm working on is with a, a nonprofit that focus on diversity in tech and. They posted the the big announcement that they they'll have an NFT project oh. and that they're going to turn into a DAO, and they got some backlash. And I'm, I like I personally don't get it, but I'm just trying to help them navigate through that. And I just wanted to see um, how other people have this been is a great question and dealing with it. It's a great question. We don't talk about this. Yeah, just to maybe um, add two points to it. Uh, so so one just just from some experience of. Uh, speaking people in more broadly call like more traditional fields. Like for instance, my, my, my girlfriend uh, is a producer, works with like filmmakers, artists, you know, photographers, uh, you know, some of them are big names. And uh, I, I like will sometimes be in the position of like explaining NFTs to them and kind of riffing on NFT ideas with them. Um, a, a frequent reaction that I will find like when they're interested and they're like, okay, I, I want to do this project and they'll kind of outline the project or what they're thinking about it. It ends up kind of being either a like add on or derivative of something they've already created. And, and that theme like comes up again and again. So, you know, you're, you're a famous filmmaker and it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this image or uh, my film and just make it into an NFT and sell it for millions of dollars. Cause I'm, I'm a, like a big name filmmaker and that, that seems really easy and like totally possible. And there's a bunch of money in NFTs. And, um, part of the answer I give is like, well, just think about it as like a separate product. Think about it as like its own standalone thing and, and think about it maybe from, from the ground up because just taking, you know, the New York times and, pasting a uh you know pdf copy of the new york times into a website like it doesn't necessarily make it like a truly web native experience um there's definitely some like skeuomorphism i think always attached with speaking with people who uh you know are, are just approaching it uh which i think is like completely fine and natural but that's sort of like where i try to gear the conversation the other part that maybe more addresses um the nft hate you were speaking to um I think it's actually maybe just like a natural thing in the evolution or adoption of like new technologies and uh, new new media. I think like, like basically every new medium receives some type of hate from um, established mediums around. I think there's always like two core themes. There's one theme is that like it's unskilled. So, you know, painters looked at the first fine art photographers and were like, anyone can do that. <laughs> anyone can kind of like pick up a camera and point and click. Impressionist painters were looked at by, you know, classical painters like, ah, like anyone can kind of just like pick up a paintbrush and just start, you know, doing like an abstract version of a flower. Same thing with like abstract expressionism or any form of abstraction. They're like, ah, like anyone can kind of like throw paint on a canvas. There's always that kind of reaction that it's unskilled and, 
NFTs receive the same thing. I mean, like anyone in the traditional art world, like it, yeah, I would say it's like pretty much ubiquitous that like looks at NFTs. They're just like, oh, these NFTs like look really dumb. They look really stupid. A child could have made them. Literally, sometimes children are making them. So, so there's always that kind of unskilled some, argument. Some of my favorite ones are made by children, actually. <laughs> yeah. The, well, what's, what's the name? Zombie Zoo. Zoo Zombie uh, Zoo. I'm always that, pumping Zombie Zoo. Zoo. <laughs> Zombie Zoo is, Zombie Zoo. is rad. Lo- love it. Yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll come back to zombies in a second. So, so um, th- there's the unskilled argument. The, the second one is that um, the medium is alienating. So uh, there, it's like you know, um, imagine the transition from uh, like a parent who was used to listening to music in a concert hall with like a symphony, and that that's a very kind of rich, sensuous experience. Or and, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you introduce like the phonograph, or you, you introduce the radio, and and, and you know the, their kids are really into the radio, and they're really into listening to like Chuck Berry or something on the radio, and, and they're like you know the, the, this whole experience of like you listening to this song on the radio is like it, it's 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 very alienating. I'm 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 not around like the community, or I'm I'm not um you know I'm I'm not getting the same type of like rich centrist experience that, that, that I get from likes going and comments. to the con- It's missing likes and comments. So it's uncomfortable. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. But it, it, it's also, uh, you know, that the internet itself or an online experience itself, or even, uh, crypto and, and some experiences there are like alienating to a certain degree. And I, I think, um, that's always just kind of endemic in like new distribution mechanisms, like new distribution mechanisms will, will typically become, over the long arc of time, like more and more democratic, they will just like reach more people. And so I think to like the prior establishment or in crowd that will feel on the onset more alienating. And I think overall, like, I, like what I think it means is like access to like the means of like producing culture or producing anything like, like as that access becomes broadened and more democratized, that is like, that is uncomfortable to like the existing practitioners or it to, to, to the existing um, uh, establishment if like more people can do it now uh, and th- like you know the uh, zombie zoo is, is a good example of that it's like literally a child now can make these nfts that might resonate with an audience and is that a good or or, or a bad thing is it is it bad that you know a, a child now can you know, have an online audience be able to, you know, as a creator, uh, you know, make something. I, I regard it as a good thing. I mean, like, to me, like, uh, I don't know, a really bad analogy is like soccer. Like, like soccer is like the most, you know, it, it's the most popular sport in the world. All you need is like some open space and a ball and, you know, some feet and you, you, you can get going versus, you know, something that requires like more structure, like like golf and so on that, that might be considered like a more refined sport. So, uh, I, I, I think the NFT hate is just part of the adoption cycle. It's like, it's like, it's, uh, and, and, and there's always going to be that piece. And, and, um, I don't know, I, I, I've made peace with it myself and in, in just the fact that like, it, it's, it's fine. 99.9% of people are not going to be early adopters. And like, that is kind of by definition, it's like, okay, that most people like it, it doesn't click for, or they, they, they don't see it. They don't, it's also like, don't feel you, it. you're not going to get what I, what, you know, I, I have astrologically, I'm like, uh, the injustice of it bothers me, but I really think like no one's going to apologize for the, what their opinions of all this stuff was 10 years from now. They're, in fact, they're not even going to apologize it eight months from now when they, when some yeah. of them start flipping. And so the only thing you can do, and this is what I resolved with my encounters with, uh, NFT hate was, Unfortunately, it's sort of balkanizing. I don't know if that's a politically incorrect term. I don't mean to use it in that way if it is. But in any case, it causes this barrier to be erected between where we instead focus on people who are building in Web3 because the people who aren't are such haters so often that it's it's like toxic to be um, broadcasting to a broad audience. And so you end up focusing on people who already get it. I do think, though, that the people who do focus, like you mentioned, I forget what you said, the organization you're working with who put out the NFT we're doing, but like whatever their their area is, if they're doing that today, they're probably among the first of people concerned with whatever their cause is to be exploring Web3. So they'll be also the first to potentially encounter like, oh, actually, you know, just selling an NFT is cool, but actually a split is really cool because then we're really using like some of the um, skip the lawyer's features of smart contracts that allow you to make like arrangements like a split without, without creating a contract anywhere except on the blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I think it's also, you know, this is like very crude, but like 
what gets people into the space is like just seeing other people make money and like just just seeing really other work. people yeah just like seeing other people be successful with the new medium people are like oh like i, I first saw it and i didn't get it and i, I kind of hated it and it went against like <laughs> a lot of stuff that i believe money. in <laughs> and and then yeah these these other people that i know or that i saw online or i read about in the news were like making all this money around it that, that that's what kind of like you know We'll, we'll make them like take a second look. And, and, and then at a certain point, it's like, you know, the, the new, the new thing, the new technology is like so well distributed and all of your friends now have crypto wallets and they've got NFTs in them that they're displaying and they're getting access to all these different things. They're getting all these types of benefits from it. Uh, you know, then, then, then eventually it just kind of engulfs uh, everything. The other thing um, I would say is that it's, it's when you're trying to like, I, this is what I told people from outside who are thinking about doing like NFTs. It's like, You've got to appeal to, there's a very small number of NFT collectors in the world today at all. So if you're thinking, if you're like a nonprofit thinking about, or whatever, some influence, it doesn't matter. If you're thinking about making NFTs on some level to generate revenues, you have to understand that there's like probably around 120,000 people trading NFTs on Ethereum total, 120K. There's like 250 million on Roblox. Like there's no one here yet. It's very, very small. And on top of that, to the point earlier, DeFi is where most of this money comes from originally. There's a handful of people who are coming in who are bringing fiat straight into ETH and buying, but most of them made money in DeFi, and most of those people came from CeFi. So there is a new culture of Web3, like, I don't know, maybe a lot of people in this room are not from traditional finance via DeFi to get their, to buy their NFT bags. But you do need to appreciate that there's a very small number of people who are actually buying and the wealth is concentrated among an even smaller group of them, as is so often the case. So if you want to make revenues either for charities or whatever purpose, it's probably going to have to be to selling to those people, which, and there's a very small number of them. So given that there's only ever been 600,000 active addresses on OpenSea, and if you look at the numbers, like it looks like there's something on the order of 100K active uh, NFT collectors, maybe a little bit more, then the things that you create have to appeal to those people. And what those people are appealed to is genuine Web3 engagement. Like there are many artists who have come from the traditional world and because of their wholehearted embrace of Ethereum and, and you know broader Web3 culture, but frankly, Ethereum, they find collectors who like fuck with the mission because they believe that they are genuinely involved and invested in the scene, as opposed to people who die, try and do cash grabs, in which case their engagement with the scene is superficial in the first place. And frankly, I think it, it rarely connects with people because the actual collectors, n no one is buying uh, a thousand ETH NFTs with fiat. You know, they got their, they got their ETH somewhere else, most likely. Yeah. And it's an argument for why, um, like native brands, whether that's a service or it's a artist or creator who's, you know, let's say making NFTs. I, I think it, over the long run, they will always kind of be exceptions and so on, but over the long run, we'll probably do better because um, they, they don't have to deal with this problem of like porting over their existing audience into the new yeah. thing. They can kind of create an organic audience that is like educated on the medium from, from the start and, and from, from scratch. And then by the time, you know, uh, adoption is like a very like spiky, messy, chaotic process. And it's, it's not linear at all. And, you know, you, you know, this happened with crypto. Like I still remember like December, you know, 2017 when things were just going totally nuts. And in the space of a couple of months, crypto went from like this kind of very, uh, orthogonal, like, you know, s somewhat known on a kind of mainstream level, but, but no one had really interacted with it to like being in a bar in a neighborhood that like did not have any, you know, tech people in it really. And everyone had their phones open, like looking at the price of Bitcoin on, on Coinbase. And, um, uh, w w when that happens very quickly, like I, I think it's those native brands that, uh, ben benefit the most. Uh, and, and it happens kind of all of a sudden. So I could totally see people coming from organizations that are trying to transition and then they find, oh, actually shit, like 90% of our audience has been brainwashed by Instagram stories to think NFTs are destroying flamingos or whatever. So then it's like, oh, well, I, there's, we can't get traction with new ideas within the structure trying to port our audience because the mo majority of them fucking hate this stuff, even though in literally one calendar year, they're probably going to all have one. Uh, so we'll go do something. So the, the main organization says, well, we can't jettison, you know, they, they have innovators dilemma. They can't sacrifice their existing built in market in order to find a new market, especially because the new market is smaller at the time. So they don't do it. And so sing individuals break off and go create those organizations. And those become the ones that are the huge organizations in 18 months or 24 months. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's I like, think, 
I think Sorry, both, go ahead. all of the points that you both have made have been um, really on point and definitely in line with what the nonprofit is currently doing. Um, they actually have been working on a roadmap to help onboard people in the space, especially focusing on diversity because that's what their mission is. Nice. So I think um, just hearing the, the you two go back and forth, I think I have enough information to help them navigate this little hurdle that they just encountered. But I just wanted to say thank you both. And I'm going to go ahead and switch back to listener. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Wow. We really solved it there, Danny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's good that she can go back with an answer of it's totally natural that people hate it at first and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, it, it really <laughs> feels good helping people, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I actually came up here just to say everything you guys said. That y'all said it perfectly. So it was excellent. Um, <laughs> for Jade, just to add, I mean, uh, there's, you're right, there's been a lot of that going on. A lot of people are getting like kept out of it just because of the fear of either backlash or not understanding but i will say a lot of you know the articles a lot of the information that has come out about the environmental aspect has been very 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 overstated uh, and i guess overvalued for lack of a better word uh and a lot of it came from one or two websites uh back in like maybe february march maybe a little earlier than that that were, was full of misinformation and, and bad calculations so a lot of what's been going around about that aspect is just flat out incorrect. So you, you could let them know that as well. Um, and then at the same time, even if they're talking about the environmental impact of blockchains, which, which is high, of course, basically reminding people that blockchains are essentially just uh, server networks and everything that we do that involves technology, everything that we do that involves the internet uses a lot of servers. So it's, it's not that different. And the fact that people are singling it, it out as opposed to everything else while we're literally on Twitter right now. I think people just need better comparisons because because blockchains are so no, new, crypto is so new, people don't understand it. They see it as this kind of crazy, ridiculous thing, but the comparisons help a lot, in my opinion. Yeah, for people who are dealing with that, I mean, I, you know, it, it's Ethereum definitely for the amount of bandwidth that you get on Ethereum for the number of transactions of things you can do on Ethereum. Uh, it, it, you know, it's very... Uh, <laughs> energy intensive way to get that much bandwidth. But the point is people often make this comparison between, uh, you know, you can do like a hundred thousand visa transactions for one Bitcoin transaction. There's some graphic from the economist from years ago. And that, that may on some level be true, but the point is that Bitcoin works without like a lot of people are not ready to accept this, but like Google operate, if you're going to calculate Google's cheap servers, you probably should also calculate like all of the, uh, fossil fuel engines of all of the Google AdSense employees' cars as they drive up and down the coast getting to work because without them, Google couldn't offer those cheap services. So it's not like there are other externalities that are not being included in the calculations that make these companies run to do the centralized versions of what uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin are doing in a decentralized way. Again, that doesn't solve, of course, these things need to become higher bandwidth and Ethereum obviously has plans for that and people don't like to hear about future plans. But... Uh, the point is like, they're not, it's not equivalent. You, you, and, and further to that point, I like to point out to people that in order for something like Visa to function globally, to be, to do what it does, it requires, I mean, essentially the, the U S military, which is the largest polluter in the world, because you need to be able to enforce contract law internationally across jurisdictions. And the way that that kind of thing has been historically established is with military might. So it's not, you know, like Visa depends on a kind of global financial system, which is enforced by not just the United States, but many other countries and all kinds of activity that is not included in the calculation of what it costs to send one transaction to swipe your card once. No one's counting in that aircraft carriers and drones and the threat of those things, even if they're not rolled out. You know, there's a lot of uh, like complex interconnected systems that are the equivalent. I think a counter argument to that you could argue is that actually the price of Bitcoin and the price of Ethereum also depend upon the same systems because if the world were to fall into a violent disarray, undoubtedly the price of Ethereum would fall because people would want food, not Ethereum as much uh, until a, a day, uh, so, you know, such as which Ethereum is so sufficiently installed that people still want the Ethereum more than food. I don't think we're quite there yet. But Nick, there's a lot it's, of other... It's too, it's too late. It's too late. I'm already tweeting Web2 is driven by imperialism. Oh, jeez. Don't, just don't quote <laughs> me. Uh, so, like, there's a lot of other, 
lot of other factors at play that people aren't ready to accept. Like, you know, Ethereum, sure, it's expensive for a transaction. Everyone likes to complain about how expensive an Ethereum transaction is. But if you can do a, a transaction like a split, I, I'll explain it briefly for people who may not be familiar, but Mirror Foundation, others have created these split contracts, which allow you to point revenues from anything on the blockchain, such as an NFT sale or any other activity you could see on the blockchain at an address. And then that address is a smart contract that will allow a list of people to extract whatever percentage is uh, allocated to them in advance thereafter with no lawyer, no uh, legal contracts, no international agreements, no checking of jurisdictions. You just do it on the blockchain and it works 100% of the time. The co code is open source. You can audit it. It's been audited, etc. So yeah, it might cost you, I don't know, $150 to set that up or even $300 to set that up. But what would it cost a lawyer to do that for you if you have contributors all over the world? It, it might be something you wouldn't even find a lawyer who would be willing to take you on because you're too much of a small fry. So to do direct comparisons, like implicit in all of this is the people who are criticizing really have not engaged with the material uh, and they're making judgments based on secondary sources. So you know, if you don't have MetaMask and if you haven't if you haven't made money on an NFT, then you, you don't know like half the use case of NFTs thus far. So, um, um, well, one, one thing that's made me think of is uh, there's an engineer I used to work with and uh, he, he, he like had to take the morning off and then we, we spoke afterwards and he was talking about what he was doing that morning and, and he was like, you know, we had to fix our phone line um, and, uh, you know, the, the phone repair or the, the telecom person like came over and they had this like really interesting like kind of gadget that they're using to test the phone lines, which was um, the, the phone line was actually an Internet connection. So it was all the, the phone was actually like voice over IP. And uh, the equipment that the repair person had was... Um, it was essentially uh, trying to reproduce the sounds that a phone line used to make, like like the kind of same uh, bleeps and, and, and boops, uh, and, and still using the same uh, kind of equipment that the repair person used to use, say, like 10 or, or, or 20 years ago. And um, the, the phone line person was actually like talking about how voice over IP is actually worse for phone calls. Yeah, it sounds terrible. Um, it's slow. There's like a longer delay, apparently. Yeah, yeah, but 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 mo most phone lines now are voice over IP. Well, like 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 most of the phone network now is voice, like even when you get a landline uh, at home, but that, that's voice over IP now. Uh, yeah, we've like, all I, been I switched think, over. Uh, I remember uh, yeah, John yeah. Carmack talking about this about how like people, uh, you know, relatively young people these days have never experienced the low latency of uh, an actual phone call, and we're all used to like <laughs> FaceTime and I guess what has been swapped out for VoIP under underneath the hood. Uh, for landlines, although I mean, fuck, when's the last time I touched a landline? I have no idea. But cell phones, in any case, all VoIP too. So it's like uh, we we don't even know. So in the context of like a VR research experience where like low latency uh, equals immersion, like we actually don't have the a comparison point that people 50 years ago would have had regularly. Yeah, well, I, I guess the analogy I was trying to draw there was like, um, you know, the the biggest network wins basically, even when yeah. it's worse. So, um, you know, people are now using voice over IP. They're, they're using internet infrastructure to do phone calls, even though it's actually worse than what exists previously. But but it's the ubiquitous network, and so that, that's the network that will end, and that's what people will, will use. And, and they'll even, like, retrofit everything else to accommodate that network. Like, the network then becomes, like, very, very powerful. Um, I, I think the same will be true with crypto in, in a whole bunch of different ways. So... Um, you know, some of the examples you're using, like, like, you know, doing a visa transaction today is like very, very cheap, but I, I, I don't think it's that crazy to, um, imagine a world where like visa will, will probably use some version of what's happening on top of Bitcoin or Ethereum to actually like process their transactions. Yeah, they're like already announcing it every six months. They talk about how they're going to do yeah, it. Yeah, that's kind of like marketing stuff. I, I just mean like in a, in a real way, like I, I think they'll eventually be like, well, like th this is the ubiquitous network. Like 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 all the wallets, right, right. Right, 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 right now, like Visa is all about just like connecting different bank accounts. Like like if everyone's, you know, account is on chain using a wallet, they're going to they're, they're gonna use that network for sure. Uh, even though it's more expensive or it's slower, it's got you know all these kind of like disadvantages to it. Like if it has a network, like that's where that, that's where the value is. I think the same is true with you know some of the DeFi things. Like you know you can imagine like these traders, these OTC guys are trying to like fill orders and do all types of hedging stuff. You know using Uniswap to like trade an order is like way worse than what you would typically get from uh, you know a, a normal OTC desk. But if that's where the liquidity is, that's where they're going to go. 
Like that, 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 that's where they're going to kind of do their trades, even when the experience is ostensibly worse across, you know, some dimensions. Totally. And I, I, I think it's also true for uh, NFTs. There, there, there's this um, company called Otis, which does kind of like rare collectible um, trading in an app. It's a, it's a Web2 company. Uh, so you could, like, I, 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 I used it for the first time, like last year. And I bought a, I don't know, I bought like a, a couple hundred dollars worth of a Tracy Ammon painting. Tracy Ammon is, uh, you know, traditional artist and, I just thought it was cool. I was like, man, like, you know, her stuff is usually like over a million dollars. Like I, I would never be able to access that, but here I can like put in a couple hundred dollars. So, so, so I did that. Um, but they're launching a new product called Otis house, which will, uh, mint physical objects that they have all the infrastructure to actually store and hold and house and transfer and so on. Oh my God. This uh, is from a and, fucking communist, uh, novel or something. You mint, you well, buy the product and you never touch it. It just stays in a warehouse perfectly yeah, manufactured for you. Or, or, or they, they, I mean, they have the capacity to go like, you know, display it, like, like, you know, t take it somewhere. Let's say the people who own it, you know, so, so they mint it as an NFT and then it gets access to everything that NFTs has. You can sell it on OpenSea, you can put it on Zora, you can, you know, a, a juice box could buy it. But it's a physical, it it's a physical thing that I never touch is the idea. It, yeah, yeah. But uh, like, you know, it, yeah, it would be a physical thing you could never touch. It could be like the constitution, Perfect. for instance. It's the and, ultimate and then, physical thing. Yeah, and, and, and then they, they could, uh, you know, they, they have all the infrastructure and the logistics and all, all the pieces kind of figured out to say, like, hey, let, let's go put this on, you know, on view at the Smithsonian, and we have the art handlers, we can go, like, move it around, and we've got insurance to make sure that, you know, if someone tries to, I don't know, wow. if Nicholas Cage shows up trying to steal the Constitution, like, they can handle that. Dow tries to uh, buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but uh, uh, so I, I think what's starting to happen there is that uh, it, it's not that, the physical object as an NFT in and of itself delivers more value. You know, having that object as an NFT, I think on face value, you're like, why, why would I do that? But it's all the kind of services, applications, liquidity that are increasingly coming on chain that you want that object to get access to. And, and that becomes the reason why. So NFTing the constitution maybe sounds stupid on the surface and maybe it is like, maybe that's like a bad example, but the idea that it could eventually get access to, you know, being owned by a DAO on juice box right. is, uh, you know, compelling, uh, for, for a variety. Right. Of reasons. The point is that the people are, people are figuring out how to bridge real world assets so that they are accessible to web three entities or blockchain. I mean, Ethereum, let's call it what it is. What's that tweet? The old tweet you've been around forever. It's like, it's not blockchain. You don't mean blockchain. You mean <laughs> Ethereum or, or whatever. Uh, you know, Bitcoin, not blockchain. Yeah. Is that it? Okay. All right. I thought, I thought it might be a theory. Uh, okay. Nima has been waiting to speak for forever. Nima, what's up? Hey guys. No, I appreciate all the discussion that you've been having. So I've been avidly listening, but, um, I wanted to go back a little bit to the, uh, sort of NFT web three hate, um, and just give a little bit of my thoughts. So I come from a music background. I'm actually in Milwaukee and, uh, I, uh, I'm deeply connected with like most of the Milwaukee music scene. So I've been an advocate for music NFTs. And so I've experienced quite a lot. You surprisingly. Poor, poor bastard. What? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and convincing and musicians I, I, of everyone, NFTs is heroic. That is dude, hard to I, do. I'm trying my best, man. It's, it's been, it's been a tough battle because one thing that I've noticed quite often is it's musicians are very against music nfts it's 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 like from the jump they do not think it's a good idea our artists are They're, some of the most conservative people i've ever met <laughs> yeah yeah totally and so uh one thing that i've seen succeed in terms of like being able to overcome nft hate for me at least it can be different for other people is but it's just being an advocate being positive and being optimistic and being willing to listen to them because i think more often than not like the struggling artist loves to tell you what's their struggle. And so if you're willing to listen to that and, and also give them the opportunity to bridge how NFTs could potentially improve their lives, uh, there's, there's been a lot of positive change with some of the people that I've been in the music scene with. So like, you know, of course I'll go to a show and people all there know me as the crypto guy. And, you know, some of them, you know, snark at me and others, you know, totally ignore me. But uh, as soon as I have a conversation with a group of people, you know, maybe nothing comes out of it. I get a DM after the show from one of their two of the guys or, you know, one of the band members and they're curious and they want to learn more. And so it's exposure. You know, I've, I've noticed that the best way to get people on board is, is, is being the advocate, exposing them and, and not being afraid to be the advocate and not being afraid to take the heat. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a long journey. And I think 
uh, over time, you know, adopters will increase. But I think if you personally want to make a change, uh, th- that's the best way is just be a positive advocate. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Ajir, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Uh, yeah, it's actually Ajir, but yeah, Ajir. that's got fine. it. What's up, guys? Hey, yeah, yeah welcome. What's uh, what's going on? I'd like to go back to something Danny said about uh, Ethereum gases. So I'm currently a builder and I've built a, a couple applications in Web3. It's it's quite funny that many don't talk about the use of sidechains to actually lower lower the fees when you've launched stuff on the on the Ethereum main chain. Like Polygon, for example, there's AVAX. And there's there's a whole bunch of other stuff, which is which is just quite weird. There's so many ways to lower gas fees right now. Yeah, I think I think um, you know I, I love uh, I love Polygon. Uh, I, I I posted a Twitter poll about this. I actually I never launched it, but I was I was working on a long project a project for a long time that I was thinking about launching on Polygon. That was the plan at least uh, for an NFT kind of minting marketplace uh, project. And I think Polygon is super cool. Um, I think it's especially cool. If you don't need the thing, like I think it works really well for ERC twenties because if you don't need the asset on Polygon to last forever, like I kind of don't think Polygon as it stands that that blockchain will exist in ten years or something. Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't want my permanent artwork to be on there. So I, I, what I'm really interested in for L twos and and side chains, whatever is, can we come up with a structure where you mint initially, you mint it on the L two or the side chain, whatever it is wherever the cheapest gas is, let's say, and then you can bring it back to L1, but the sort of canonical mint will end up being the version that was on L1 rather than if you just like naively deploy a NFT contract on Polygon and then bridge to L1, the NFT actually depends upon the security of L2, which you don't, or sidechain in that case, which you don't want. But if you could create on L2 or sidechain and then bring it back to, so I think a lot of people in the gaming uh, space are, are starting to think in this direction because you can't play games on L1. Essentially, it's too expensive. Although I don't know if anyone has done the minting part on the sidechain or the L2, but I totally agree with you. Uh, the fees, we need to find solutions, and and I would love to see some cool tech in that direction. Am I, am I the only one who believes that the fees are a feature? They are also a feature, but they, listen, there's a big difference between if you had some ETH before it cost $5,000 <laughs> a coin, and it, or if you don't. So if you actually are entering with fiat, it's so expensive to do anything. It actually costs $300 just to do an OpenSea buy without, if, if the NFT is free. So I think that's like unacceptable. If we want to onboard new people, we're going to end up in a Tezos world if we don't solve that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's just, it's, there's, it's a tiny little audience that's on here already. So for everybody who hasn't made any ETH or doesn't get paid their salary in ETH, it's so expensive to do this stuff. Especially if you're from a part of the world where, where, uh, you know, you're not earning USD, it's even worse. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, you know, th- th- there's an interesting equilibrium to think about between like the comments we were just making before about, you know, the, the network that becomes ubiquitous has the most value because there's all these other applications you can interact with and so on there. And so at what point does, yeah. you know, is, is, is $300 too expensive to actually get access to kind of the rich ecosystem that's there? Is it, is it $500? Is it like, like, a, like a, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is a point at which the market starts to say, this isn't really worth it. Maybe we're actually already beyond that point. Like just the existence of other networks kind of, and that, that actually have, you know, a non-trivial amount of activity, it kind of like points towards it's, it's very that equilibrium. Yeah. I'm curious. I, I talked to a lot of developers get in touch with me from India and many of them are interested in chains other than Ethereum, POS chains that have cheaper gas. And I think that's like indicative of something. It's like, sure, the developers in America and ancillary countries are you know have made some money in ETH perhaps, and so those developers are happy to continue building on ETH. But if you're a developer in another part of the world and you didn't start off with an ETH bag, maybe maybe you just don't even. I mean, how can you even deploy your contract? It costs like fifteen hundred dollars US to deploy a contract or something. It's too much. Yeah. Is there anything to actually track? I know that there is some there. There's a website to actually track gas fees, but is there anything to sum up the rollups and the side chains to see? which is best for developers to really optimize gas fees. Is, is there a tool for that? You no. just want the cheapest EVM chain? Is that what you're looking for? Like I think Polygon, well, of, the, of the major options, I think Polygon or uh-huh. BSC maybe, uh, but Polygon I think would be the cheapest one to deploy on gas wise. Uh, but then it's not, it doesn't have the actual security, it doesn't inherit the security of Ethereum. So 
an L2, an optimistic roll up like Arbitrum or Optimism are, are um, considered to be more safe options. Although if you look at the details, there's recent tweets from transmissions uh, that I, taught me something I didn't know that Arbitrum is kind of in its current like alpha, beta, whatever phase it actually has a very similar security model, a trusted security model with a multi-sig uh, as Polygon. So it's, it's Arbitrum is like, apparently, according to the tweets that I read, Polygon and Arbitrum both depend upon bridges that are controlled by multi-sigs and Polygon additionally has a proof of stake validator network that is somewhat centralized with like Binance and others. So you're kind of making a, you're making a compromise on security on both in terms of a centralized bridge from what I understand. Uh, and then Polygon also has an issue of validator centralization. Uh, you know, it depends what you're doing. Like uh, I think for uh, a newer developer experimenting, I think actually being on Ethereum is really bad for you because it convinces you that you shouldn't deploy unless you really know what the hell you're doing and you could lose people a lot of money, et cetera, versus like Polygon. It's like, geez, I, why even use Testnet? Just do it on Polygon. We, we should all just shift to Rinkaby. Well, I, I, some people have been floating this idea. What if Rinkaby became a valued asset? Like, and I, you know, what if it wasn't POA? What if it went straight to POS or something? I think there's a problem of who has all of the Rinkaby right now, but it would be interesting to, for some reason, Rinkaby feels like slower or s sort of sluggish compared to Polygon, even though I don't think that's, I don't know if that's accurate. I guess it is. The block time is maybe a little bit longer, but you can get right at the top of the block pretty easily. Ajir, does that answer your question? I don't, I don't know. Are you, are you looking for like where you should be deploying? I know that Hasu, I think, shares occasionally this. I've seen a site go around that compares all the L2 options. I can't remember what that site is called. Danny, do you know? Like, I think there's uh, Arbiscan and uh, there's uh, optimism.arbiscan.com and so on uh, that, that do track gas fees. But I'm trying to think one that. But there's like L2, L2 fee. Oh, what's it called? Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll take a look. I'll see if I can find it and tweet it out if I do. Um, but yeah, you can also go polygonscan.com, uh, RB scan, both are by Etherscan company. Uh, if you just want to see the like current gas price. But, um, yeah, you cleared up some, some questions for me still, but what, what I really wanted to, to point out is the, the, the development of the ecosystem itself. There is so much need for, for tools for builders to actually optimize the entire building process. So that's why I was really asking, is, is, is there a tool? Or let's look at VS Code, the, the GitHub Autopilot AI, AI optimizer, for example. What if there's a tool to, to help optimize the code as you're... Well, you're I think, you know, most of the chains that we're talking about is like, you know, uh, EVM chains. So forks of EVM, so Ethereum, uh, all the L2s, uh, optimistic L2s, um, Polygon, BSC, Phantom, uh, gosh, I don't even know other ones. Loot, loop Ring, I guess. Um, actually, I'm not sure about Loop Ring. But in any case, any you know, if you write Solidity and the chain supports whatever version of Solidity that you're writing, it'll work uh, for any of those. So if you use Hardhat and whatnot or uh, DAP tools or uh, is it called Forge, um, Georgios' new thing, you know, all of those will, will output code that will run on all those chains. As far as I know, I, I honestly haven't done that much development on chains other than Ethereum and Rinkeby and a little bit of Polygon, which all works just the same. So those are all going to be compatible and the same tooling will work for all of them. I, th I think if you go to like ZK Sync, you start looking at ZK options. I think there's a Cairo, a Aztec. Uh, I, I think you, I don't need a Polygon Hermes. I, I don't know how that works, but you, you might need to integrate some custom stuff for, especially for ZKs. I think there's other affordances that you need to take into consideration, but I haven't done any ZK development, so I don't know. Cool. Well, I hope that was helpful. Um, I guess we, we have been going quite a while. Uh, anyone else? Uh, or I guess Iban, uh, what's up? Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, what's up? Um, I was just going to say the, the website I think you were looking for is called L2Beat. Um, L2Beat. Yeah, and they have a breakdown of um, uh, L2 solutions and uh, also fee infos. Oh, cool. I hadn't seen this one. Actually, for, I found the one. I was looking for L2Fees.info. L2Fees.info, oh. but uh, I just see screenshots of that. But L2Beat, I think this one's new to me. L2Beat.com, anyone looking? Yeah. This looks pretty cool. What do you, uh, what do you have to say about L2s? What's your, what's your experience of L2s? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I, uh, I tried Loopring out like in May, I think. Um, nice. And I was just like fucking blown away by, by how, how quick and cheap it was. And uh, I kind of forgot about it until, you know, they started popping off um, recently. 
And uh, I'm uh, I'm just waiting for that sweet sweet responsibility. Honestly, um, uh, I think I think that'll be that'll be pretty sick. What's that? What's but that? I don't even know what that is. The the the, the governance man. Uh, we, we we like the governance here. Uh, oh, um, oh 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 oh! I see what you're saying. I see. Okay okay. I thought yeah. I, that's what I thought. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, but no, I mean I, honestly, I'm super pumped because I think it does like it obviously solves all these scaling solutions, right? Um, where you're not spending. I, I, Dude, I had no idea it was 15k is what you said to to deploy on, on mainnet. Uh, no, um, uh, I mean I don't know. Like it, it can cost, it can easily cost you a thousand dollars to deploy on mainnet if you're deploying something sophisticated. It can cost a hell of a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean that that's that's crazy, right? Um, and I, I'm just I getting. Mean, it, 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 but it's like Danny says, it's like it's also a feature because it's like yeah, you know, if yeah, you yeah. It, you know, it takes a certain. It, it's like look at like everyone wants Polygon NFTs banned off of OpenSea or whatever because they're like trashy because it's too cheap to make them. And then <laughs> right. p- chains like Polygon have this state problem where because it's so cheap to send transactions, the bots can be like a whole order of magnitude stupider and more risk. Oh, I know. Inclined. I, I got the. Uh... Uh, for, for people in the room, maybe you know, but for people in the room, like yeah, yeah, yeah. they could just like bloat the the you know the state with like all kinds of dumb transactions. It's really cheap to revert transactions, so you can do things that you don't think will work just in case. Uh, it's really dumb. Anyway, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, layer twos, you know, kind of kind of solve everything, right? I'm not technical enough to like give a, a dissertation on it, um, but from what I've used, you know, uh, Loop Ring, uh, zk sync. I just donated to to Gitcoin using zk sync. It was that's awesome. very slick that's very slick yeah yeah seamless five bucks it was great um so yeah i'm i'm just i'm excited for what they do i think uh, i think it's gonna help open up the space even more and so yeah absolutely totally on the same page uh all right i guess i'm i'm probably gonna call this quits soon enough uh is there anyone who wanted to say any uh anything before we we get going any final comments all right well it's been great having you all here Thanks for joining me for the first episode of Web3 Galaxy Brain. <laughs> uh, I see Ravel is in the audience. Uh, they help me create podcasts sometimes. Well, at least episode two of Solidity Galaxy Brain we did together. Uh, so I wonder I wonder if people are going to want to listen to a two-hour and 25-minute recording. If you're hearing this in the recorded version, thank you for making it this far and see you on the next episode. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>